This program was recorded on Monday, June the 19th, in the year of our Lord, 2017. The opinions expressed by the participants in the following program do not necessarily represent that of this station or its management. Or anybody else. From the John DeVito Recording Studio, located in an undisclosed and clandestine location on the great northwest side of our fair city of Chicago, we once again are pleased to be presenting yet another edition of our monthly roundtable panel discussion show, Meet the Chicago Historians. Now here's the guy who started it all, John DeVita. Well, thank you very much there, Rich Lang. From the John DeVita Broadcast Center, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another broadcast of Meet the Chicago Historians on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Monday, June the 19th, the year 2017. Today the panel will be talking about time zones in America, standard and daylight saving. So sit back and enjoy, meet the Chicago historians. And now to start today's broadcast, here's our announcer, Mr. Richard Lang. And now here's our panel moderator, Jack Red Ryan. Jack? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. In this beautiful, uh, we're just about on the edge of the summer uh, solstice, being the 19th, so that'll be the um, the longest day of the year. Not the longest day in the movie, not the longest day June 6th, but it'll be the longest day as far as daylight goes, and it'll be officially summer. A fellow lately, what would you say? Anybody think it's not summer, Bill? What, Bill, Bill Kogelman? Oh, no, it's summer. Yeah? It's summer. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I can't uh, wait for uh, tomorrow. It may snow. You know, this is <laughs> Chicago. So, yeah. you know. Just Weathermen talk about meteorological summer, June, July, and August. Tom Skilling is always yeah. talking about meteorological summer. Yeah, I never understood that. Which yeah. is the th they do it by calendar months, June, July, yeah. and August. Summer it's not. Yeah. And identify yourself. I'm John Escachoco. I'm a former state representative and town assessor in Cicero. And like most of us here, an alumnus of the old radio station WJJG. Yes, sir. My announcer, Rich, you were on already. Yep, I'm your announcer, Rich Lang. I've got a background in teaching American and European history, and I'm also involved in a group that recreates old-time radio shows. Yes, sir. Is that the, the official one from the, the Those Were the Days players? Or? No, the Chuck Shaden yeah, sponsored yeah. one. Anything go go going on with that? Or? Yeah, yeah. Anything yeah. coming up with that? or? Well, we're doing about three more in the area. Eisenhower Library will have a show by us uh, mm -hmm. in December of this year. Otherwise, we go to uh, some nursing homes and uh, churches. Well, what do you, what will you be recreating? Do you know? Well, generally do uh, who's on first, Abbott and Costello. Yeah, yeah. Throw in a Bickerson uh, script. That's a popular or two. one, I know. Yeah. Bickerson. Oh yeah. People tend to like comedies. Yes, they do. Much yeah. more than drama. Tell yeah, us yeah. where the Eisenhower Library is, uh, Rich. Oh, it's on one of those O streets. <laughs> about the middle of Racine Avenue? And it, it's on Wilson. I would say about three to four blocks west of Harlem. That's yeah. Chicago Public Library? It's on, it's on Okito. So it, it's, it's a uh, Harvard Heights Norwich Public Library. Okay, so it is. It's okay. outside the city. Yeah. It's okay. on Okito and Wilson. Thanks. Okito mm -hmm. and Wilson. Thank you. John. All right. And yes, sir. Let's hear. <laughs> what, what is your name, sir? Sir. Speak up. You've been hard. <laughs> My name, I'm Don Peter from Oak Park, Illinois. Yeah. And? I'm not an alumnus of anything. Nothing? Nothing. Must have. Where'd you go? You didn't go to school never? I just never don't admit it. You were born in Arkansas? Yeah, I was born See, in Arkansas. Then you look like, look like the Clintons, doesn't he? Arkansas? Yeah, during the Second World War. Yeah. And yeah. Wow. then the next day, Hitler quit. Uh -huh. Heard I was coming he and he gave up. Yeah. You're an Arkansas Razorback. I don't know. What is a Razorback, anyway? It's a pig. It's a, it's a pig. type of pig that has a wild, ridge, like a ridge down wild boar. Yeah, yeah, wild, wild boar. Was right. My dad yeah. always talked about Arkansas Razorbacks. Yeah. Isn't there a team, football team? It's yeah, like college, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's their, it's just like a Kansas Jayhawker or Missouri Alabama. Sooner, Crimson Tide. Uh, yeah. uh, Georgia. Georgia Peach. Georgia Peach. I don't know what, I don't know. No, that was what Ty Cobb, the Georgia Peach. The, How about, hmm. Bulldogs, what Georgia Bulldogs. Which which one is it that they're trying to get rid of? That uh, 
uh, the people are not satisfied with uh, is it the is uh, it politically incorrect? Yes, yes, Wait. incorrect. Baseball, football. Yeah, was it Redskins? The Redskins, yeah, yeah. yeah. Washington Redskins. Oh, and yeah. Cleveland Indians also. Named. Indians, yeah. So the commissioners. Oh. He was going to talk yeah. to them about that name. The Illinois. Uh, Fighting Illini. Fighting Illini, and oh yeah. Florida Seminole. The Atlanta Braves. Right. Somebody was talking about Native American Indians. They're going to refer to them now. I don't know why or if it <laughs> has anything to do with it. Yeah. That's a that's a sore point with me because the way I calculate it, anyone who's born in the United States as a citizen of the United yeah. States is a Native American. You're a native. Bo you're in certainly a native-born American. Yeah. Yeah. They always use that term legally, a native-born American. Yeah. yeah. It was a Native huh. American party which was anti-Irish. The Nativists, yeah, they used to, the to the talk Indians. about the nativists, yeah. 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 Uh, there was a no nothings? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah. An article in the, uh, I believe it was today's paper, might have been yesterday's, about uh, Stephen Douglas. Hmm. They want to change the name to two S's at the end of it. Like Bobby Douglas? The school, <laughs> the school uh, on the south side, uh, because Stephen Douglas was... Uh, anti uh, was uh, Pro slave, oh, no. and and the the two S's uh, would make it the same. I, it, as Frederick it, it Douglass. Just, yeah, like it Frederick just yeah, it's ridiculous. Last it's completely nonsense. You know? change somebody's last name. Douglas yeah. was it was a Union man. There's a famous story. You know, he 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 lost the presidency to Abraham Lincoln, but he was a staunch Union man. Died early in the war. Yes. But when yeah. when Abraham Lincoln was inaugurated, he was on the on the rostrum. He held Lincoln's hat. Yeah. He held yeah. Lincoln's yeah. hat. The defeated candidate, while Lincoln gave his inaugural address, and Isn't loyally it? supported Lincoln for the few months yeah. remaining in his now life. There's right. that famous time Lincoln's right after his talk. He says, "Stephen, would you hold my hat while I go to the rostrum?" <laughs> <laughs> that stinks. But I'm, I'm I'd keep my daytime job if I had one. <laughs> but no, you're right though. When, once the war, he was very much uh, well. The same way with. Um, uh, the Union Neville Chamberlain was very much in support of Churchill after yeah. you know, that happened. So. Churchill spoke well of him when he died, because Chamberlain died early, just as Douglas died early in the war. And Chir Churchill, who had, uh, Chamberlain had done everything he could to keep Churchill out of government for years. But when he died, Churchill gave a very moving eulogy hmm. for Chamberlain in the now, House of Commons. Folks, yeah. if you don't know, Winston Churchill was the prime minister of... <laughs> United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland for how long? And he was a Lord of the Admiralty or something? First yeah, Lord of the Admiralty. Yes. Yeah. And he also had an American mother. Yes, right. And uh, that was our great ally in World War II. Had he and Franklin D. Roosevelt, that was a president here, young folks. Right. <laughs> These are things you probably don't learn in school. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Not anymore. No. Wow. No, we learn about different tribal people somewhere and their chieftains, but we don't learn about your own. Uh, uh, I know a friend of mine, uh, one of the, well, one I worked with for a while. His son said a friend of his said, "Your dad couldn't have been in Vietnam. That was before World War II." Uh -huh. So I mean, that's that's true. No. This is. I ran yeah. into some people. I was at Starved Rock a couple of years ago with an excursion with the town, and they have a museum there. If you've ever been to Starved Rock, and I was I was walking around, and there was there was a a. a Artifact there that had the the cross of Lorraine. If you, if you know Casablanca, you remember the fellow with the ring oh, that yeah. has the cross with yeah. two cross bars on it, which was the symbol of the French resistance. Burger, Norwegian. Because yeah, <laughs> because uh, Charles de Gaulle was from Lorraine. He was from Lorraine, and so he used the cross of Lorraine as as the symbol of the resistance. And I looked at it, and there were some people there, and they asked me about it, and I was telling them what the only thing they knew about World War II was that it had something to do with the Holocaust. They really huh. didn't know much of anything else about World War II. And these are people in their f late 30s, 40s, I would say. And they really, De Gaulle, the name of De Gaulle meant nothing. They'd never heard of Charles De Gaulle. That's right. How old were these folks? You know? I say they, were 30, they were late 30s oh. to, four, I'd say between 35 and 45. And they didn't know anything about World War II. They knew there was a war and had something to do with the Holocaust. I think that's, that's the general uh, feeling of, of this generation yeah. too, yeah. Ken. Yeah. You know, isn't there? Is paraphrasing if if you don't know history, you're bound to repeat it. Do you think that's done on purpose, to uh, anybody? Sure. Oh, so, I suppose. You yeah. know, they, they called Mar ours a dummy down generation. Yeah. Dumb oh, down. 
they're not they're not kids I mean they're not if that's the level of, of uh, knowledge I mean de Gaulle was one of the great figures of the 20th sure. century and these yeah. people you know, they, they, the name did, they, they didn't even recognize the name they'd never heard of him they didn't know who yeah. he was or yeah. if, if they do teach it they teach it what they think it should have been oh yeah oh sure yeah yeah like a revision historical yeah. revision yeah. 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 Change in which we're generally the, the villains the only thing uh, over there now is the airport the Where? airport is de Gaulle Oh, in France, yeah, in France. But the yeah. people, well, he's remembered. They still I'm sure. remember in him. France, they remember yeah. him. Yeah. Um, there was a program on where a bunch of maybe veterans, five or six, and they were like rock stars going into these little towns, and they they come out and school children had a day off and Saint Miracles and. What was sure. the one on the steeple? The yeah, that's Saint Mary Glees. Yeah. That's where red button, two, where red buttons wound up hanging on right, the. There was the two or three yeah. towns like that. If you go to the, if I, I've never been, but if you go to that Saint Mary Glees, they have they have a dummy hanging from the steeple of the church, yeah. exactly because everybody asks about it, and they decided they would put it there so that people would would, would know exactly where right. it was that red buttons was hanging. He lost his hearing. Was hanging on the yeah. Time. Ding dong, yeah. ding dong. Yeah, I know yeah. But yeah. Uh, if. Um, <laughs> I understand. Well, we just touched on it, but uh, uh, generally, now you you spent some time in France, Bill Cole, correct? Right? Lived there for a couple of years. Uh, yep. Now there was sometimes there's an attitude of Parisians that like anti-American or snob. Is that, is that true? Yes, yes, very much so. In French. in certain certain parts, and and maybe some of that is our fault too. No. You know, uh, you go over there and uh, you know act like Mr. Big, I suppose. Uh, yeah, I, I can understand that. that can, yeah, 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 and uh, but but it's a uh, it's a sad. Uh, at least when I was there, I'm I'm going back to the late fifties. Uh, when I was there, uh, it was sad to see these people, just uh, like like we're saying now, they knew nothing about the rest of the world. Yeah. Just about what uh, their little towns were, and and, uh, yeah. and and they had a very, very, very bad feeling, of course, to the Nazis, you right. know, for what they came in and did and they can't uh, be wiped out. For that. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's uh, uh, my son was born there, and uh, I don't know if I've, I've told you guys this, but. Uh, uh, he he was a French citizen, being born in France. Oh, sure. Besides being an American citizen, he being born with with want. me, he had yeah. dual citizenship, and he had to pick one or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, if he, uh, one of the things, if he went to France, and they were in a war, he could have been drafted, uh, being a French citizen. So he had to pick, and then when he went on the state police. It was even more so that he had to pick, because uh, he was afraid that there would be something, you know, help maybe held against him by being a French citizen too. How right. was your son born? In uh, '58. Okay. Hmm. That's yeah. when just about the year De Gaulle came out of retirement. Yeah, was it? yeah. That, yeah. Is the, that is yeah. the year he has. Yeah. 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 Back to was the and uh, Republic became, or became he went Premier down and set up yeah. the Fifth Republic. He In many ways, he saved France. It was really disintegrating the exactly right, right, exactly right, right. but but you know most people don't know that oh, right. but uh, Johnny got called then for the state and um, uh, I said you better go down there it's time for you to declare. to uh, uh, well declare that you're a US citizen right. but deny that you're a give up your French citizenship right. he didn't know if it'd be used so he did he went down to the French consulate and uh, uh, he came back and uh, I said, uh, how'd it go? And uh, he said, uh, okay. And he was kind of smiling. And I said, oh, what, what, what? He says, well, they wanted to know why I was giving up my French citizenship. And, and I had to sign some papers. I said, what'd you tell him? He says, uh, well, I told him that my dad didn't want to have anything to do with the frogs. And, uh, <laughs> oh, uh, that, and I said, you didn't. He says, yeah, I did, Dad, I did. Oh, oh, oh. Well, it's my dad would say, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was quite an experience, though. Uh, International. Uh, well, anyway, I know one advance for Franco-American. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that thing, comes with um, a can, doesn't it? <laughs> the ugly American. Sure. <laughs> they don't make it now. They don't make it anymore. Sure one do. thing for sure. 
the cartoonist loved De Gaulle, this tall guy with the, the big nose, nose yeah. yeah, and yeah. Uh, that the uh, the, the big like, hat, the Foreign Legion hat, yeah, with one of uh, the actual. Uh, but um, the middle of summer over there could have been a hundred degrees, and the police and the and the armed service of the uh, the army, they all had on this heavy heavy. Uh, overcoat that was their uniform mm -hmm. whether it was the middle of winter or the middle of summer they wore that and, and you could just see these guys I mean they were just you know yeah. useless yeah. really if yeah. you had to use them I uh, understand the police department was that way up until O.W. Wilson come to town he the idea of the short sleeve shirt and the lighter lighter uh, blouse yeah and, sure. yeah I imagine the New York police, they used to wear that tunic, you know, that yeah. buttoned up nice tunic, and I don't know that they had any special uniform for the summer. But oh, I don't know. Well, I mean, I that, a lot of know, weird stuff. But I'm saying here. Remember, we bought Falcons there. for police cars? Yeah. And yeah. Comets? Yeah. yeah. Now with, uh, I mean, here in the fire department, here we had that heavy uh, overcoat, and uh, I still got mine laying around somewhere. Well, you had one, one uniform, the dress room uniform you never used, wasn't it? Yeah. When you said, but I have it. Yeah. Just had to have it, and. Uh, I can't think of the name of it now. We, we had a name. Well, we had a name for it. I can't say it here. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, it, I mean, it was just. It was. It was like a horse, horse hair blanket. Very heavy one. Oh yeah. yeah. Wool. It was wool. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Anyway, but as far as the French go, I understand it's a little different than the. Uh, Normandy, the attitude toward the Americans, is that true? Well, one thing they always say is people, most Americans who go to France go to Paris. Right. Mm -hmm. And the Parisians are not just contemptuous of Americans, they're contemptuous of everybody else. <laughs> they don't, they don't like no. the British, they don't, like, they don't yeah. like the French who live outside of Paris. They just have a very superior attitude. And they say if you get outside of Paris, and particularly you go to Normandy, it's a totally different yeah. attitude. And, and in Normandy, there have been documentaries on Channel 11 how the school children still right. come out and decorate the graves. The yeah. mayor is there, and they have ceremonies every right. year. And I've ta I know I have friends that have, that have traveled in France, and they say the people in the, in the provinces of France, they're wonderful. They're very, they, they have no hostility to Americans. You know, it's just Parisians are, 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 remember. Parisians are arrogant toward everybody. And and sort of all like judging all Americans by New York. New, yeah. Sort of well, like and all they're talking about is or the Chicago money. Ones. The money. Yeah. Chicago. Ones, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good friend of mine has got a a condo over there, and he goes to Paris quite often. Don Rose, and and uh, I I've often wondered, you know, for what, for what, especially at this age, you know, yeah. uh, uh, it, it's uh, it's a different way of living. There are people yeah, no who doubt live in, about it. in big cities who think that everybody else is a bumpkin. That if you yeah, don't live yeah. in the big city, right. that you're a boob. We you run know. into those people every day. Yeah, yeah. And the funny thing is, the big city guy often is a bigger hayseed than the, <laughs> the country guy. <laughs> he thinks he's so sophisticated yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. What, you, what you just said before, Rich, about that made you think of Manhattanites, maybe? <laughs> there's a I'm certain attitude. A few times yeah. I've been in New York City, so there's a certain attitude there. You yeah, can't wait, generalize wait. it too much. Kate, Kate wants to talk, too. Oh, of course okay. we do. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> New York City, it's like Chicago. They got little, it's like a bunch of little towns put together. I oh, mean, you go down the street and you yeah. get guys selling buttons and ribbons and one guy selling pork chops and the other yeah. guy selling steaks and... <laughs> But generally, though, you'll hear the people who travel a lot. Sure, Chicago is another big city, but there's a certain friendliness here. I've heard that that there was. I don't. I don't know. I don't know if that's still the case. I, I mean, there was. I think there was a time when this that was true. Yeah, they got to go go to the Ciceronians. They'll show them how to. Well, I know. <laughs> just, just look at the person. I mean, well, I was going to suggest you look at the personality of the the mayor of the city of Chicago. Ooh. <laughs> well, he's not a Chicago. Which we learn from him. He's not a real Chicago. But he was Obama's chief of staff, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah, he was. Never let a crisis go to waste or something? Or yeah. His, uh, yeah. So, somebody said that. Yeah, he did. He did. Oh, okay. He did. Anyway, what you just said, too, about uh, uh, lack of friendliness, I've, I was told the same thing. My son-in-law is from uh, 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 Maryland, from uh, Salisbury, where they have that big race. You know the big race in Maryland? What is it? What's the big, big race, this you know, horse what, race? The Preakness. No, no. The other one, the Salisbury Stakes. Da 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 ah. da. <laughs> oh, okay. Much, much friendlier overall. It's kind of hard to get. That, that I'll, I'll fill in for your friend. That was Jack Ryan, yeah, folks. Okay. That uh, said. Yeah, that. Tom was there to give the, the, the uh, you know, 
Send morning. all of your, your comments to yeah. Jack Ryan. Lee. The, um, um, when we, we made our first trip to New York, you know, we cut through the, uh, the uh, Holland Tunnel, I guess, coming from Jersey. Jersey. I, I asked some, whoever was the ticket guy, what do you want? What? Right away he was on edge and jumping. I think, oh, I see. <laughs> I get it. I bothered him. Not that we don't see those types here, but um, but anyway. Well, we can generalize no matter what. you got to judge an individual as an individual nonetheless. Am I right? Am I right or am, am I right? Yes, you're right. Can't yeah. take it as yes. an individual. Yes. We'll run that by Tom uh, McKenna yeah. next time. Anyway, you young kids out there who we were talking about want to catch up on some knowledge of World War II, we might suggest, uh, and our program recommends right. highly, you get... Um, DVDs of the uh, series Victory at Sea from 1952 NBC. Those are fabulous. Uh, it's worth it for the music alone. Richard Rogers wrote the score. You know what? I, I and I uh, still get the uh, History magazine bum, that's bum, put out bum, by. Uh, bum, uh, bum, bum, bum. Oh, who is it now that puts it out? And then there's a Reminisce magazine. Right. Yeah. And then there's a. Uh, uh, well, the National Geographic puts yeah. puts a lot like of that, history? and I I keep I keep yeah. those and I give them to my grandkids. Mm -hmm. Make sure that they got them and uh, they know what uh, what history is about, you know. And they do seem to be interested. Yeah, if you talk to a kid like, what what is Vichy France? What are you talking <laughs> about? What is that? Mm, yeah, <laughs> they think it's a drink. Yeah, and you can make the point too that, that World War II was the last war it? we won. Or the Free France that they that Germany didn't take over. Well, they really did. Vichy was the Vichy was the capital of the the government of Pétain. Yeah, the puppet. Yeah. When when Germany occupied, when they defeated France in 1940, they divided it into occupied France, which was pretty much the north and the west, all the sea coast, Normandy, Paris, right. and Paris was part of occupied France. And then there was what was called unoccupied France, which was the south and east. And the capital of that was at a little, a, a relatively small town called Vichy, which is where the government had wound up when they fled Paris with the, the German invasion. And so uh, Marshal Pétain was the head of state. And it ended, I think, in 1942. The Germans occupied, they, they occupied all of France. They, they were dissatisfied with the way the Vichy right. government was operating. They occupied the entire country. So where did De Gaulle end up? United States, England, London. England. Okay. He fled. To, he got out before before France yeah. fell and set up a government in exile in London. He was sentenced to death by the Vichy government, what they call in absentia. In the he absentia didn't, they didn't. They didn't. They didn't have. They didn't have their hands on him. But he was sentenced to death as a traitor by the and, Vichy government. And likewise, uh, uh, Pétain, Marshal Pétain, was sentenced to death by the French. After when and uh, de Gaulle commuted his sentence, though he I was, that, yeah. he, he did. He, they didn't really. He he was, he lived out the. Ra he was already close to ninety by that point, yeah. and he lived. But he he was kept in prison for the rest of his life. I think in the final weeks of his life, they took him from the the prison. He was on an island called the island of Yu, and they took him on shore. And he for, spent the last couple of weeks when he yeah. was dying. But, but wasn't yeah. the real head of state of Vichy though Pierre Laval? I think that he was. I he, think he was executed. He, Laval was executed yeah. as a traitor. Yeah. Head of state, Pétain didn't want the title of president, so they called him head of state. He was the equivalent of being the president. Laval was the head of government, the equivalent of being the prime minister. And Laval was a much more slavish pro-Nazi than, than Pétain was. Mm -hmm. Pétain thought he was... He was serving his country that he was going to try to make the Saving conditions it, huh? as bad as yeah. try to make a bad situation a little better. He was quite old. He was already, I think, he was already about in his 80s, I think, when, when, when Germany like invaded. Him. Wasn't he was quite old. And it, it, there's some question as to whether during the war he really understood what was being done or what, what documents that he signed, whether he really understood what he was signing and what the meaning of it was. But nevertheless, he was sentenced to death when... Uh, when the when France was liberated and, and De Gaulle was back in power, and uh, what do we have then? <laughs> De Gaulle coming back, ten twelve years later, uh, to uh, save the. Yeah. Uh, yeah. De Gaulle leaves leaves government around forty six. He retires yeah, and, right. and he's in. He's yeah. He got a little fed up with the. He was disgusted with the, the the bickering exactly. because the, the French they went right back to the way things had been in the thirties bickering. 
Ah, Poitiers. Yeah. Very good. The French uh, historic photo. Very good. Very good. Uh, he got disgusted with the political bickering and went back. Lived, he lived in a, a, a tiny village called Colombe les Deux Églises, Colombe of the Two Churches. And he stayed there for 12 years until he was called back to save the country from chaos in 1958. Did he have any descendants, De Gaulle? Or he had a son no. named Philippe. And I'm not sure. I, I, he, he's probably, I, he may be, be gone by now. I, I don't know what... Oh. No what he, what he had in the way of a career, I, he never he didn't have a particularly, uh, you know, political career. I don't know if he, I don't think he ever served in political office, and he had a daughter, he had a daughter I believe who was uh, had had mental impairment, hmm. and uh, yeah. he had a daughter that had to be cared for as a, pretty much an invalid. Well, a lot of there's a lot of irony with a lot of this. Like for example, not to change the subject, but uh, Sergei Khrushchev is an American citizen now, Nikita's own son from. From, uh, was I he Russian or was he? Uh, what was his uh, actual message? He was more Ukrainian. Khrushchev Ukrainian. was Russian, but he, he wound up he wound up the boss of the Ukraine. He was always right. associated with the U. He was the political boss of the Ukraine. Yeah, he he commanded. Ar he was a political commissar for the right. army in the Ukraine. When they starved all the people out. <laughs> I I don't know that Khrushchev was personally involved. That was early on. That was in the twenties. I don't think Khrushchev was not that high up on the pecking order at that point. Is he was he was a big cheese in the 30s, in the yes. 1930s. Is it was it Khrushchev or Stalin's daughter who's now an American citizen? Khrushchev. Yeah, she died though. She, Svet, well, once Svet, was a Svetlana. She Ali. was here too, right? Svetlana was there. Yeah. Svetlana Stalin. Yeah, she. They all come there. here, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that? Well, Pretty how come Party town. What? If we're so awful. Why does he want to come here? What is this? What is this? Stalin had a, an older son who was an alcoholic who died mm. from alcoholism. Wow. He became a general while Stalin was in power. His career plummeted when his father died. Oh. And he had another son, Jakob, yeah. who was captured by the Germans during World yeah. War II and died in a, and died in yeah. a German prisoner camp. Didn't he become a comedian, Yakov? No, no. 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 not Yakov Stalin. <laughs> of course now, folks. Any idea so what Gorbachev is doing right now? She's do you go back to he's, Russia? He's up. He, he's just kind of. He's up in a. You see him on occasionally. They interview him on on yeah. documentaries and things. He's he's obviously. I think he defended uh, Putin lately. His actions in the Ukraine. I believe he spoke in favor of Putin. I, I don't. He he's not well thought of. He is not right. well thought of That's by the Russians. <coughs> he's not not highly regarded. I know at the time the Soviet Union was breaking up and uh, Reagan had just come out of office and it was now uh, George H W Bush was the president and there was a breaking up and there was this change breaking thawing of the Cold War and there were a lot of people who were like speaking as if this is all Gorbachev was <laughs> doing it was all because no. Gorbachev was so wonderful and someone said the only I can't remember who this was the only difference between Gorbachev and the or other Soviet leaders is he's still living <laughs> that's what they, uh, they said about him the fact that the Soviet Union is gone is thanks to the man I used to call that genial old gentleman from California yeah. and the Iron Lady from from Great yeah. Britain, right. not Gorbachev. But isn't the current whatever he is in in Russia trying to reestablish this little? Oh yeah. Thing? Oh, I Putin. think he would probably like. Oh, that's yeah. the glory. If he could, it, but yeah. it's it's like the old Sir Humpty Dumpty had a great. You can't put it back together again. Well, what what they he, had? They, he you can said never that put it back together. The worst thing in his life was when the Soviet Union broke up. It was the worst that's catastrophe that's of the twentieth right. century. Oh. Actually, reality. He's, he's an ex KGB. Yeah. Exactly. So he's no Eagle Scout. <laughs> no, <laughs> sure. no, he's, no, he's not an older boy at all. Yeah. He's not even a Cub Scout. <laughs> no, there's some nasty ass that way. You talk about secret police. I mean, if you think the uh, United States has some, <laughs> these guys were uh, bad, bad, bad. Of course, they had a license to do it. Like these famous uh, in Poland, they spoke of World War II as being the country, the war that they lost twice. They lost mm, with the, the German and the, the, the Nazis and with the Soviets. Yeah. So. And uh, there was a famous incident that was originally blamed on the Nazis, the Katyn Forest Massacre, where how many thousand Polish officers, officers were killed. Officers and right. aristocrats and yeah. intellectuals, and that was yeah. all done by the KGB. Yeah, the, right. the, the, then it was Russia. the NKVD. The right, the same thing. Precursor the of the KGB. The Russians. Beria. And they, they, uh, I was reading something how they did it. They had big generators going to make the noise, bring them one by one. They had their famous wave. He shooting right in the back of the head and killing him instantly. And when when the when the Germans and the and the Soviets were were finalizing their pact 
Uh, they, had, they, 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 they came to terms before the war began, and then they had another big meeting when Ribbentrop went to Moscow after the war had already started. And they had a huge banquet in the Kremlin. And Stalin pointed to Beria, who was the head of the NKVD, and he introduced him to von Ribbentrop saying, this man is our Himmler. Mm -hmm. So he understood exactly what the yeah. relation was between the, the NKVD and the Gestapo. They were the same thing. And at that happy note, is it time for a break? Is it time for a now break? Now it's <laughs> our first brief intermission. You've been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians. We'll be right back. Doing pretty good. Pretty well. Well, friends, now that the warm weather has arrived, it's time to plant your flower and vegetable garden. It's not too late to start planting your flowers and vegetable gardens. And I have just the right place for you to go. Get your flowers and vegetable plants. You can go to Pesky's Flower Gift Shop Garden Center and Greenhouse, which is located at 170 South River Road in Des Plaines, Illinois. Pesky's has a very large selection of flowers, vegetable plants, and much, much more. Whatever you need for your flowers or vegetable garden, you can find it at Pesky's. And once again, they are located at 170 South River Road. They are just north of Route 14 or Minor Street and south of Golf Road, which is Route 58, on the west side of River Road. And be sure to stop in and visit their flower and gift shop. Again, Pesky's Flower Gift Shop and Garden Center, located at 170 South River Road in Des Plaines, Illinois. River Road is Route 45, and they are on the north of Route 14 or Minor Street and south of Golf Road or Route 58. You can call Pesky's at area code 847-299-1300 for more information. Again, that phone number is 847-299-1300 or they're located at 170 South River Road in Des Plaines, Illinois. of Meet the Chicago Historians. Jack? Well, welcome back. We've just been talking about the differences in uh, uh, World War II and uh, different bits of history that seem to be forgotten these days. And uh, we had, we had, if I remember, we had just recommended Victory at Sea as an excellent primer. Was it 26 episodes or half hours that they made? or It came out like in 1952-53. Right. NBC. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, listen, kids, get it. It's be, it'll be such a pleasure to look forward to the next one. And the music alone, the Richard Rodgers score, is just yeah. inspiring. Went to, anybody argue with that one, Bill? Not at all. No, uh, no. Uh, is it Time Life, or who who has it on every so often they have a, a deal on buying yeah. it? I bet it is Time Life. Well, yeah. If you go to Amazon.com, or you can go to eBay, and you'll get a deal on some. Yeah. A True. little cheaper, True. and you know, I know I bought mine there. Yeah, and I bought, I bought them as gifts already too. Originally, weren't they aired on a Sunday evening? Yeah, I forget the night. Yeah, like but that. they were yeah, big series. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That's years ago, and I remember they showed a submarine diving with the appropriate music. Yeah, yeah, the, the music the opening. Really. Yeah, yeah. Well, they would also. Um, those different uh, themes have, I mean, different themes have titles to them. Uh, very, very famous one, of course, Guadalcanal March. Guadalcanal was the first offensive we actually took it to, took it to the Japanese. Very costly. It took a long time, but it was. If you notice in this episode, they introduced that theme very s quietly and easily, and it raises, it raises, you know, to like a crescendo, symbolizing the fact that we, things were on the up. 
you know, they were looking better for, for us in, in the beginning. I mean, uh, I wasn't around then. Can you, anybody here can remember any of World War II? Bill, can you remember? Uh, I you was a uh, kid. Uh, oh, yeah, I was a kid. Uh, the yeah. only thing I've got is uh, uh, some mementos yeah. that, that people that knew my dad knew me that would right. send back because yeah. I was. Without being it, embarrassing, it, what year were you born? 35. So you were you know, not even five, six years old. Yeah. Yeah, when uh, Pearl Harbor came in, so yeah. we were kindergartner, right. like yeah, right. Like right. my grandson is right now, the one boy. So, yeah, you one thing I, I all we did was, uh, uh, you know, the nuns sit down and pray. Hmm. You could argue that World War II was the last war we won. The yeah. enemy was clear. The enemy was oh, yeah. evil. It was all good and yeah. evil. Everything since then seems to have been. Uh, but actually, <laughs> they were. Starting in Korea and Vietnam. <laughs> Unlike the Kaiser, they, they made the Germans into the Huns in World War well, One. And yeah. to me, the, Germany was no more to blame for that war than anybody else in World War One. You know what? And, and the, the uh, media had a lot to do with that, too. I think so. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well, Gee, do you think? Ever since World War, the media's yeah. had a lot to do with yep. it. Yep. Anything that happens now is through it's the media. And it's spin. Mm. Yep. Yep. I know there was a big... Uh, there was a lot of sentiment in, before we got involved in World War One to come in on the side of Germany because you had anti-English uh, sentiment among the Irish immigrants who were here, the Irish Mayor people. Big Bill Thompson wanted to punch King George Kaiser in the, in the nose. nose. Yeah. 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 No, no, punch the King of England in the nose, wasn't it? Who was King George? Yeah, 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 right. Which one? George and the V. George, George the V. Yeah. That and, uh, there, of course, there were a lot of German, yeah. people of German descent in the United States and... Uh, my, most my mother, uh, I, I just, I don't know who told me, whether it was my mother or, you know, at some time, or I heard her talking that that uh, her boyfriend at that time, which they had talked about getting married, was a, uh, was a German. And he left the States then from Milwaukee and uh, went back there mm -hmm. and was killed then. Uh, he joined the, the no. German army. And uh, uh, she says otherwise, you know. My mother had a cousin like that too. Yeah, yeah. your yeah. your dad would have been uh, would have been him. Now in the 1930s here, before World War II started, there was this German American Bund they call it, the yep. Volksbund or whatever. Yep. On the surface, there was like a cultural and uh, like the Boy Scouts. Yeah. But underneath it all, they were really looking for little Nazis here. I believe wasn't that what it was all about? Well, mind. They were looking to change minds, and uh, yeah. uh, I mean, you know, it's uh, uh, that was all Hitler's doings. That's, the yeah, they war prevalent was really prevalent up until Pearl Harbor. Then it yeah. just kind of fell apart. Charles well, was Lindbergh was a major spokesman for yeah. keeping us out of war because he saw he? he thought Germany's victory was inevitable over, yeah. let's say, England. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, we it's just it's stay interesting. Out as long as possible. Interesting that we'll hear so much uh, uh, prejudicial evidence about, say, for example, the post-World War II era and what they call that McCarthyism and uh, the, uh, the, the uh, for example, the Hollywood, whatever they were, number blacklisted because of their sympathies towards Communist Party and the international communism. But no one ever objected to the fact that they got involved in, in, in uh, um, uh, examining this Bund, you know, the, their activities. You know, I, I mean, it was... Very, uh, very prevalent here in uh, the Chicago area. Uh, with the big German population. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. You know. Forest Park. Hill. Tell me about wow. it. <laughs> my, huh? my mother's people are German. So. My mom was yeah. born in a foreign country. She was German. She was, hmm. she yeah. was well, born my mother was born in, in a foreign country. But um, uh, it, it, it's just interesting that the different attitude when you're talking about two different totalitarian systems. We had just defeated uh, international fascism and uh, Nazis and the uh, Imperial Japanese, and here's this former ally of ours. Only through, I mean, you know, we were about as much allied with uh, Soviets for the re one reason: the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Right. Not because yeah, we're right. Right. ideologically uh, Uncle Joe. Unless you are somebody who were. We had <laughs> liars, liars, and uh, worked for the New York Times. A guy named right. was. But as soon as the war ended, it turned it did 180 degrees. The name was Walter like Duranti. Was the head of that <laughs> bureau in the uh, New, New, uh, New York Times bureau, and for years they covered up all about these failing programs. They covered up about um, uh, what was going on in the Ukraine, painting a rosy picture. 
Well, you know, go ahead. No, yeah. I was say the United States and Britain were allies in World War II mm -hmm. because we had common goals. We we sh we had so much in common between our two nations. The United States and the Soviet Union just happened to be fighting the same enemy. That's it, right? I mean, we had nothing else in common with the mm -hmm. Soviet Union other than the fact that we were both at war with the Germans, which was enough. I mean, we wanted right. the German. The Germans right. were the immediate threat. The Nazis were the immediate threat. Right. And but but beyond that, we had absolutely nothing in common with the with the Soviet. There must have been some fear that uh, I mean, Stalin, the former ally of the German, the Nazis, right? For two years, the, could, the could they Soviets flip again? were virtually <laughs> allied. Yeah. There could he flip again and go back? Oh, yeah, he, Stalin could. would have sold the West out in a in a in a minute yeah. if he'd had the opportunity. The, uh, that's why there's such there was such care in the, I know uh, in our own uh, public uh, our public. Uh, Forums, you know, like uh, radio, tele uh, no television, but the radio. Uh, there was an, a comedian named Burt Gordon who did a character called the Mad Russian. Used to appear on when mm. was on with Ed mm -hmm. with um, Ooh, yeah. what's his name? Uh, Fred uh, Allen, I think. Was it? How do you do? Was his? Uh, How do you do? Well, yeah. well, during World War Two, they referred to him as our Russian friend. <laughs> <laughs> so. And then, and then the picture here's one for you. Has anyone ever seen Mission to Moscow, the movie that was oh made? Uh, I've never seen it, but I know. I, I wish I could see that. It's, the really it's an apolo it's an apolo apologetic for the for the Soviet well Union. Well, they've got uh, I, that was that was the idea behind it. I think it was to soft soap and keep them on our side. Mm -hmm. I think Walter Houston was the star. of that. He was. Yeah, he was. Uh, he played the. Uh, and I can't think of the guy's name. Was the ambassador? Yeah. Was from his book. Yeah. And, uh, oh, uh, and I, I saw it recently. I was like, I think there were two. Bullet. Of course, I'm judging it by today's eyes, not trying to keep them in line as our as, as fighting on the same side. Because we know, as you've mentioned this before, John, they had the population, they had the people. Right. We might have had the weapons, but they had the manpower. But they lost the more of all the. What, 23 yeah, the million? Russian, the Russian po I mean, our population was not much less than the Soviet Union. You know, yeah. they, they, had, they had a few million more than America. Right. But, but the point but was. You know, if you want to look at it in a very cold sense, every every German that died on the Eastern Front fighting the Russians was a German that the Americans and the British didn't Did have, have to, to kill right. on the Western Front. Well, sure. So I mean, yeah, it, it, yeah. It, naturally, it was it was to our advantage for the f to, yeah, to no. maintain this relationship with the Russians, and we kept them in the war. If it wasn't for American lendlease, mm -hmm. Russia would have been knocked out of the war early on. They would well, have never survived in, in no. England. But if it wasn't for whatever reason Hitler decided to invade Russia, no. I mean, they were it's not just ready that. to invade England. And then for some reason, was it in 40, maybe 41, they turned around and started. Began planning for the war against. But they never, well, see, they could never get air superiority. But remember, no. they didn't invade England not because they, they were nice guys. They couldn't get air superiority. That's what the Battle of Britain was all about. They were right. trying to knock out the RAF, and they couldn't do it. Right. In and the by Russia the end, the RAF was knocking out more at airplanes than, than they were able to, to knock down of the, the Royal Air Force. And the Germans didn't have any what we would call heavy bombers. No. They were all mostly dive bombers and fighters. They never built any number of big four-engine bombers right. like our right. B-17. or no they, had no, no, they didn't even have dreams of anything like the B-29. Well, we would we all agree that Amer American commerce and industry had a lot to do with oh the victory. God. Absolutely, oh. we argue with that. Absolutely, something. everybody went to work. What was the? Uh, it took how long to build a ship originally? And Henry Kaiser got it down to men or hours that they could actually put a, one of those ships together, a Liberty ship or. A yeah, I think every maybe one a day, and then yeah, something like that. Willow Run, I think it was every one every mm -hmm. two or three hours. I know, I know Henry Kaiser, they, they both, my dad always told me about how he was building, a, launching a Liberty ship a day. They didn't build a ship from Not start to finish himself, in one no. day, but they were launching a Liberty no. ship no. every day. They no. had one little slight problem with the Liberty, the first ones, they used to break in half. Huh? They had to put a belt uh, around it, weld a belt around it to keep it together. And I think all the ones after that were all built the same way. I had an uncle, he had three, I think it was three, Liberty ships, you know, he was on were sunk, and he survived the war. He was in the Merchant Marines, and they weren't like that much either because they made a lot of money. Who's that? Though? Well, they were. Well, it was, it was a different situation. Right. They were. They would be like the but same way. They were on. Well, the, for a while they were armed. They had maybe with maybe a six-inch gun on the front. They put of some it. ships on, yeah. Yeah, huh. but I mean, they were kind of like the story. Ducks. The story was told in the. 
action in the North Atlantic with Humphrey Bogart was all about the Merchant Marine and what they were going through beforehand. They did actually put some uh, uh, weaponry on. Uh, on right. The, on the sh it's an interesting picture, though. It's almost like there's a, a little microcosm of the whole Allied world crossing the ships from Norway and everywhere, all, you know, Iceland and uh, uh, wherever else, what other countries. Are the, the, well, I, what other countries are there? I mean, uh, if anyone thinks that the United States, United, the Great Britain, France, and a few others were the allies in World War II, Go to the encyclopedia and look at the number of countries who did declare war. Oh, sure. Now, mm -hmm. How much yeah. active participation? Yeah, that's, I don't know. that's something but, uh, else again. Everybody, were, it was truly a world war in that sure. sense. All of Latin America. You know. yeah. Where are we now? Bill, what do you think about that? <laughs> I, uh, you know, I was just thinking about this uh, uh, TV program that was on the other day about Watergate. I don't know if you guys that. saw that or not. It was... Uh, Oh my God, it was like two hours, I was going back and forth. And uh, it dawned on me that, uh, okay, Watergate was, there are a lot of people involved there. A lot of big name people too. Yeah. But you know what? Same thing is happening today. Nowhere to the nearest. Same no, thing is Not happening. to anywhere close to the extent of that. Uh, it's, uh, it's coming. At least it's not so far. I mean, there may be something yeah. out there. Well, right. I would like not you to so think far. that. Yeah. Too many parallels. But all it is is right, as far as I'm concerned right now, is like smoke and mirrors. They never really come up with anything substantial. Uh, maybe they will, but... It's the media. It's all... It's mm, the media with the smoke and mirrors. Yeah. yeah, and some kind of sources. Yeah. Well, it's like... It's like um, they never um, show them or tell we're them. We're going to are. indict... They, they, they don't like the fact that an outsider won the way <laughs> this guy did. Yeah. He won by talking and saying things that the common man was thinking about all the time is what it was, you know, instead of this... You know, you're talking about putting uh, putting a, a heavy gun on uh, these merchant ships and that, and uh, how, like you say, uh, history repeats itself because uh, these ships that were going back, this is just going on now. Ships mm -hmm. going back and forth across the Atlantic, Pacific, uh, and they are being pirated. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And yeah. nobody had any America, guns though, on them. Yeah. Yeah. And and now, oh hey, oh we ought to put some guns on these. Well, uh, not we ought to stand up for ourselves. Nazi the shipping companies are arming them too. Are them arming That's what I'm themselves. talking about. Yeah. yeah. Nazi Germany had something called a surface raider. It looked like a merchant ship. The silhouette was of a merchant ship. They fly a merchant flag. Mm. And as whoever it was approached them, it was like the pirates. They changed and open fire or whatever. That ought to be tried now with these people you're talking about, these pirates. Yeah. Blow them out of the water. Yeah. Uh, send a few of them back and tell their bosses what uh, what, what they're going to more get more of. Because you gotta, you, you got you to gotta look out for your people no matter what. You, and if you're going to put them in harm's way, if you ask them to uh, risk their lives, you have to give them all the protection you can. I, you know what? I, I'm not a, a, a seer of, uh, of the world's problems and that, but... Uh, it just seems that everything you read in the paper that you, you, you talk about now is uh, based on, and, and your insurance, all of this stuff is based on uh, uh, you're afraid of liability. Mm -hmm. oh, you're yeah. absolutely afraid of liability. And if we don't learn to start standing up, you know, it's gonna. It's. It's not gonna change. Not gonna change. That and the reliance or whatever they on unnamed sources. What the heck is that? Yeah, that could be anything you want. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think sometimes it is. Um, and, and and it's well. How uh, of course it's less and less than it was. But how much credibility is out there for the the general news media right now? I mean, uh, with me none. I mean, oh, I, mean, I, mean I, mean, I don't know really how many. Same here. Take I, I think. There's some indication that more and more people are just tuning out the news. I, I know I don't watch yeah. as much news. For years, I always watch the evening news, usually yeah. CBS. Right. And I'm increasingly, I'm skipping. Maybe I'll watch the first five minutes just to see if anything important happened. Right. Five or, and, then, and then I turn something else on. I'm not going to listen listen to somebody else's political prattling on. I, I like the 6 o'clock news for the, what was going on locally, more or less. <laughs> and the rest, I go to, I go to Fox News all, all the time. And I go but to... Uh, even... Internet. It's just my opinion, but even the weather, I think they hyped that. 
<laughs> so you keep listening. They, they were saying for three weeks we're going to have heavy thunderstorms this week. Well, wait, we've never had them before? No, <laughs> but I mean, like you know, if they say it long enough, sure, maybe it's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> What I mean is they, they make a big deal about the big snow or whatever, and, they, and they, they're covering this. And We've been all through, through all this before. That's right. But what they want to do, why do these no local shows or these shows have to have somebody out on that scene, out at, at the <laughs> 35th and State at 10 o'clock right. at night to tell you the report about well, it? Used they have to, to be standing out there in the yeah. cold when yeah, it's, yeah, you know, nothing going on there anymore. rain it, gear on. As if, it's in California. As if you don't know what's happening. They couldn't just yeah. as easily be sitting in a studio telling you what's yeah. happening. A, a, a CNN Often crew. Often on an expressway overpass, yeah. A CNN crew in, New in uh, France a number of years ago, they were supposed to go to Algeria or something to cover something. They went to a, in front of some mosque in Paris, <laughs> filmed it there <laughs> with the mosque in the backdrop, <laughs> never even left uh, France. I mean, they were quite at They're it, foreign correspondents. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. you got to have that guy uh, along the lakefront or the ocean front yeah. Uh, yeah. getting soaked right. and, and, right. and frozen. Yeah. And, uh, but now like you it's going to, you know, yeah. does that make it better? Yeah. Well, now you got networks on the news 24 hours. Yeah, right. They run a loop, yeah. and then they got to figure something else. It's always news right now. Uh, one of the best, what we just talked about there, Bill, and we're, we're talking about being on the scene. Remember when uh, Jane Byrne defeated Michael Bolandic in that primary? What year was that? 79? 78. 78? I think it was 78. Channel 2 News, there was, there was this place just no, closed. 79, I'm sorry. I think it was okay. 79. Forgive me. Place just closed. Shallers Pump. The tavern, the tavern was like almost right across the street from, from Daly. Daly. Ward headquarters there. Yeah. They just closed down after how many years? But anyway, John Drummond's over there. And he's <laughs> just some guy in Shallers. Excuse me, sir, are you a political worker? The guy says it with a straight face. No, I'm an astronaut. <laughs> 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 it was so funny because he managed to maintain both of them managed to maintain the straight face during the whole situation. But they're uh, having a big problem there with that Shellers is, uh, uh, you know, splitting the money among family? his yeah his yeah. heirs and that. Uh, Jimmy Cosgrove, the Sergeants Association, mm -hmm. had their their uh, office right across the street. Right next to the ward office. Yeah, it's not anymore. Though. No, not they anymore. They bought that building no, over on Pershing. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. But, uh, we used to go over there a lot. Yeah. And, uh, oh, I like Shell. Oh, yeah. 36th, 37th, and Halsted? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah because there was nothing around our union headquarters. <laughs> to about a year ago, Jack Scheller was well, he was still living. He'd be in there every night. Yeah. The owner. Yeah. Of, uh, and, uh, um, good bowl of soup. Yeah. Chili. Yeah. Uh, every, every, every. Every Thursday was corned beef and cabbage. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why. It's not really an Irish dish after all. It's an Irish American thing. But uh, my cousin, when my cousin When Jack, the legend you know, becomes oh, fact, print yeah. the legend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you lie an awful We're lot, it's going to be it's gonna be accepted as fact. <laughs> but you know why they call it the pump? pump they had a direct line from the brewery next door. Oh, ne Nectar oh, Premium. Oh, yeah. Nectar oh. Premium was the brewery. Do you remember oh, that name? Oh, yeah. Okay. I yeah. thought they had a pump it to get the... No, it was a direct, a direct line. That's what they mean. It's now their parking lot. So, <laughs> yeah, we, we missed them. We used to go there before a game or after a game. Uh, well, the White Sox, that is, folks. They were talking about that. The other, the other team in town here. But uh, uh, anyway, it was so funny though with John Drummond. Excuse me, sir. Are you an ast are, are you are you a political worker? No, I'm an astronaut. <laughs> you know, and the funny thing is, Drummond was not an airhead. I mean, he was no. an old. He was kind of an old-fashioned. You know. Uh, Hard-working reporter. They used to call him Bulldog Drum. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. He was from the same school. as you remember Len O'Connor? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And I am Len O'Connor. I think O'Connor. he worked for every station here, didn't he, Len, at one time or another? Was it, yeah. was it Channel 9? Or He was coming out of a, a elevator. He was cussing and swearing and everything. And I think that was his last time on TV. Well, right? he, no, he, lost, no, no he, he, he blew up. What, what They used to tape those, those commentaries of his. Yeah. And if you've ever done TV, you tape it, and you don't like it, so you do it over again. You right. do it over until you get it right. Played the wrong one. Well, they did one where he blew up. He, he, he blew his lines. He was, you know, he's reading the script. He skipped a line. And then he did it again. And then with the, when it happened the third time, he exploded. He started cursing. He crumpled the paper up and threw it. <laughs> Imagine that. Well, then he did it over and did it right. Well, inadvertently, maybe inadvertently, <laughs> or maybe yeah. they ran the wrong <laughs> tape one night. And uh. they ran the one where he blows up. <laughs> and, throws. and I remember Flo I, I was watching it that night. And Floyd Calvert came on. You know, he, he was, he was the, the anchor man. 
they cut the caliber, and he said, well, folks, Len's been under a lot of pressure recently. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of do remember that now. Yeah. I yeah. I was, but, uh, he's going to be under more trying to find another job. <laughs> no, he didn't get fired. He, he didn't get fired. No, for, for anyone who don't know what we're talking about, go to YouTube. I think there's some of that on YouTube. <laughs> YouTube.com. We'll have some of that. But this man was so low-key, and he'll be giving his commentary. And as I said, Edgar Bergen was a very famous <laughs> ventriloquist with Charlie McCarthy. Len's lips moved less than Edgar's did, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, I, and at the end, it was all, before you know it, I, I, I am all kind. He was had some good comment. He yeah. did very well at it, actually. It was uh, it was like a verbal columnist, is what it was. Yeah, yeah. Opinion, you know. yeah, an opinion piece. I mean, those days they used to at least label the opinion. Right. On he the looked kind of like a big owl. Well, what, big was, what was the ev- evening news? A half hour, twenty minutes. Well, in, in the fifties, it was fifteen minutes. Yeah, right? okay. I remember when it was fifteen minutes. Right. Yeah. Of, uh, he Faye, the Faye news Flynn, at one time too. Douglas Edwards was the man in those and, days. And yeah. Yeah. he yeah. would do fifteen minutes of, yeah. of national and world news. Right. Douglas Edwards with the news. Cronkite did fifteen minutes for the first Big year up. or so. He took over in sixty-two, mm-hmm. and it was only in sixty-three. It was like in the fall of sixty-three that they went to thirty minutes for the evening news, and on the first night. That they were going to a half-hour broadcast. Cronkite's guest was President John F. Kennedy up mm. in Hyannisport. They're sitting out on the veranda there in lawn chairs, and he did this interview with Kennedy. And this is maybe two months before Kennedy's assassination, oh. but they had sure. this interview with with JFK. He talked about Vietnam too. Before before he was that, he was with the as Prudential Insurance Company of America presents the 20th century. Remember that. Uh-huh. Uh, Series of well, 20th century. That replaced right. Sun, uh, You Night. Are There? Anyone remember You Are There? Yeah. yeah. Do you remember You Are There? Oh, yeah. I'm sure the I rocket, know the that rocket a radio show. up. And yeah. well, that, that was what you would call the original docudrama. They yeah. would go as if through, as if the camera's eye was a newsman covering the eruption of Mount Vesuvius yeah. or whatever. And and you the, assassina- people, the real assassination you know, of Julius Caesar. Caesar. Yeah. They would interview it's by interviewing people in the scene. It's really well done like that. But that's it's a clever idea of modern reporters as if they were covering a historical yeah, event. We'll and, and yeah. interview. It was it was a very clever idea. But, that, but then as I said that one, it was uh, started on the radio, which I didn't know. All things are as they were, except yeah. you oh, are right. there. Right. So you know. You're talking about 15 minutes when it started. <laughs> no. Now, Channel 7 oh, yeah. has got... Two hours. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Two they hours. Got 15 minutes of commercials back to back. Well, yeah. and when well, they, they got the whole first hour. When four they to did five. 15 yeah. minutes. 5 to 5.30, then it goes to national news, then comes back for 6 to 6.30. Six it was yeah. news, weather, and sports. Right. I mean, it was yeah. maybe like five minutes of news, then maybe three or right. four minutes of weather, and then two or three yeah. minutes of sports, and a commercial or two, which was standard oil, you know. Right. And they do those. those and you have, uh, speaking of sports, let's look at sports with Norman Berry. Norman Berry? <laughs> Norman, Norman Berry? He was, he coached the Cardinals. Oh, he was a football. He was <laughs> he was George Gipps' roommate down in Notre Dame. When <laughs> the guy who very really famous. Channel Seven had Alex Dreyer, yeah. the yeah. man on the go, oh, yeah. which was odd because he, you know, he Alex Dreyer, you would you would have needed a forklift to, to get <laughs> Alex Dreyer in yeah. and out of the, the anchor. You're sort of like a William Conrad <laughs> in Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't well, yeah. strike you as a guy that was this this dashing news he corp. Was, uh, you know. He was a big shot in the OSS in World War Two. I have heard that. Yeah. He was, he, was actually, he was a very intelligent guy. He was a very, yeah. very knowledgeable guy. He was voice. also in uh, yeah. some movies in the 30s. He's a ring announcer. Uh, yeah, he's uh, made a few fights. Yeah, no. he's the ring announcer in, uh, or not the ring announcer, the, the radio announcer covering the big fight. And here comes Mr. Jordan. It's Alex Dreyer. Yeah. Okay. And he went back there. He went to the movie stuff. He was playing like an Orson Welles type I would say villain. Like for a, a while. Sydney Green Street type part. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't they have fights? Uh, I guess it was one of the channels live on. Friday, sometime during the weekend. Friday, they had two nights of NBC. I think it was NBC had the Friday night fights and maybe the when there were two nights a week. Wednesday night was uh, Pat Blue Ribbon with Jack Drees. Yeah. Right. Friday night was from Madison Square fights, Garden with yeah. Jimmy Powers. Remember? Yeah. Don I Dunphy. I remember that name. Don, Don Dunphy. Dunphy. Yeah. Yeah. Then I do. Sugar remember. Ray Robinson. That was in his career. And bowling was big on early TV. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. bowling. Yeah. Whispering Jacks. Yeah. Whispering Jacks. Yeah. Yeah, there was one of uh, Archer <laughs> in California, and it was up on the second floor. Big bowling alley. Second you know, we, we, a hardware let's, let's store. over to the next period, the next yeah, hour. We're, we're coming up on Local a sports and whatever. Now, now you're talking. Oh, right. we, we, we got, got a minute to kill. Anybody got a story about a minute, you know? Not Remember really the, the stock car races at Soldier Field? That was big. Yeah. I mean, they were... 
they would pack the whole place. Well, I'm just thinking of Marty Fay. Those commercials that Marty Fay, Fay would Marty do. They have a, they'd have a table laden with cups and saucers and all these things that you could get if you if you were one of the first 50 people to buy. You'll get this complete well, set of china. And his big thing is Electrolux vacuum cleaner. The old, the old pitchman like Lynn Burton. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For Lynn Burton for certain. Lynn Burton, <laughs> you're a wagon master. Yeah. Well, you could get all that stuff if you bought gas on st the weekends, too. That's you, nice what's that? Jim Moran. Your courtesy man. I bought a car from him. Bud Hauser. Did it turn out well? Yeah, it yeah. was a 67 English Ford. Moran would come no, on, there'd no, be a sign the, behind uh, it, would say $195. The, um, oh, yeah. And, yeah. and, and Moran would say, you may be wondering, what about. kind of an automobile can you get for $195? <laughs> well, let's say all you're looking for is transportation. Basic transportation. <laughs> well, we have here this 1954 Dodge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, pardon me, gentlemen. Yeah, it might yes. even have wheels Once again, I must interrupt. You've been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians, and we thank you for it. We'll be right back. someone that has constant pain of their low back, neck, shoulder, knee, or wrist? Have they tried medications, exercise, physical therapy, or chiropractic, and nothing seemed to make it better? Well, I may have your answer. Why not try a napropath? Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Wayne Chickowitz, and I've been practicing 30 years treating pain. I'm board certified and hold a diplomat in pain management. For your convenience, we have two locations in Cicero, 3602 South 61st Avenue, 708 656 or in Villa Park at 122 West St. Charles Road, Suite 1A, 630 833 4007. Why not try a napropath and stop the pain today? Back to our show. Well, that was a fast one. We are we have we have motion, ladies and gentlemen. I don't want to. I know this is going to disappoint many of our readers, our readers, our listeners. Uh, but many of our listeners are going to be disappointed to hear. We have voted to table <laughs> this this month's discussion to next time around. Motion to table. Is there a second? Second. All in favor signify by aye. saying aye. aye. Opposed nay. The motion carries and it is so ordered. As, uh, as Speaker Pelosi was saying, we got to yeah. pass the legislature to see what's in it. Remember that one? We were going to talk about kid, um, time zones and sa standardized time and all that. And it's a very interesting history behind it. However, we're kind of lacking we're a forum for one. We have <laughs> next time. Well, we'll, we'll okay. the next time. Very good. I like that. Da, 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 well, we're da, da. talking now about local television and what was popular at one time and personalities. And uh, well, who were we doing before about different we're automobile about Al, We were talking about Alex Dreyer and uh, well, P.J. Hoff, the weather man. Right. Okay, what about Clint Yule was the weather oh, man yes. on Channel 5? Yeah. On it? NBC, yeah, Channel 5. What's the outlook, P.J.? PJ yeah, P.J. Hoff on Channel 2. Always had a little cartoon. Mr. Yellencuss. Or we have right. the vice president in charge of looking out, out the window. The window. Yeah, it was P.J. Hawk, wasn't it? Yeah, P.J. Yeah. Hawk. But well, I think one comment. And, and when, the, when the hay fever season would arrive, he would give you the pollen count from a little fellow called Little Achu. Oh, yeah? little oriental oh, fellow. Oh, oh, little oh. Achu would be politically oh, incorrect. That sounds today, terrible now to yeah. say that. Oh, my God. But I think one youngish commentator who's maybe a, a successor in the sense of the old Len O'Connors and such, and he's made the rounds of all the stations, Mike Flannery. Yeah. 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 Well, well, he's yeah. on Fox Mike now. He, around. I think, yeah. spent a lot of time on Channel 2. CBS. He's on 32 now. He's the tallest 32? One. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When I was in, in the legislature, I talked to Flannery several. He was covering this, the, the General Assembly, and I had a chance. I was at a couple of functions where he was there, and I talked. He was a, he was a decent guy. He was a nice guy to talk Good. to. Yeah, I fair mind, came across as a fair-minded individual. Yeah. He, uh, during 1980, uh, during our... Uh, Union problems. Why Mike uh, was the only guy that I left to uh, that I would let come up hmm. to our office, and so I got to know him very, very well. And uh, uh, he uh, he wasn't like a regular <laughs> reporter. He, Watch your language. He reported the the uh, the actual. He's mm -hmm. actually telling you what Thanks. happened, really. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. No. And, uh, no, Mike's Mike's a good guy. 
I mean, we were going to write a book together, in fact. Too, oh, really? Too, too, too many people, is, they go by, never let the facts get in the way of a good story, you mean? Right. That's, That's right. it. That's you know. right. <laughs> what That's was that with Megyn Kelly? She, oh she got God. in trouble because she didn't st stick to a script or something? I think Megyn Kelly thought she was going to take out Donald Trump in that first debate. No, this is just like no, no, I'm just my opinion. Hostile. But yeah. I just my, my my curbstone opinion. I, I saw that the very first. I think it was the very first of the Republican debates about a year ago. It was about a year oh, ago. And, a year. And maybe maybe a little <laughs> less than a year. Maybe more than that, but but it was early in in 2016. She was very hostile. All the candidates when they had 42 guys up on the John, platform. Would you say she looked very hostile from the get go? Yeah, I think she, she thought she was going to do that. She was so clever, and and Trump, of course, everybody figured Trump was a boob, mm -hmm. and she was going to destroy Donald Trump, and that was going to be her ticket to the big time that she would wind up on CBS or NBC. And I thought that you know she felt that that a couple of really hard hitting questions, and of course Trump just came right back at her which is not something Republicans are noted for. They usually fold whenever the media goes after them. I, and it, it just boomerang. Now she wound up on it. She did wind up on NBC. But that debate did not turn out the way Megyn Kelly thought it was going to. She thought I, she I was going to destroy it. Her her, uh, her status has fallen, actually, some. She, has, well, she's she wants to be another Sunday Barbara Walters. Huh? She's got a Sunday she's night program. A, I know. But opposite 60 it. Minutes. Yeah. But didn't she yeah. get into, or somebody got into trouble because... What? Either she asked questions she wasn't supposed to ask, or and didn't Recently? want her. Yeah, didn't I, want that, her I, I don't really want that. I used to like to watch her. Yeah, but I turned. The, I used to turn the, the voice down. That's part of it. <laughs> no, she's 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 good. I mean, and and um, none of those folks are super whatever. I mean, uh, the only what the old saying is that he puts his pants on the same way you do or something. But there's some are better than others, obviously. But it would seem like um, uh, you can't get too much of your own in, uh, your own ego into into this, or I mean, I mean that's what happens to you. That's, you know, you that's what happens to all of them. Yeah. It seems you know you got to take them over a pound of salt. Oh, what's his name? Brian. What's his name on NBC? Brian Williams. Williams. His, his Williams. The, was his uh, plane was under fire. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah remember? Yeah. And what do they get these stories? Well, so was Hillary Clinton. Yeah, she's going to say, we landed, we had a yeah. drunk, and it was, <laughs> why, do they, why do they say these whopper? And they, are they so used to telling lies that they believe their own stuff the or what? The truth is going to catch up to you someday. How can you deny that? What is yeah, Brian's yeah. name anyway? Brian Williams. Williams. Oh, yeah, I was going to say Brian Wilson. Brian Williams. So that was oh, the Beach Boys. Beach Boys. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Brian Williams. better work, too. And his career, was, <laughs> his career was on the ascendant until he got tripped up with that. Now, with that now they still got him under contract on yeah. cable, so yeah. he shows up over there, but not on the big, you know, the big Cronkite seat or Huntley and Brinkley. Remember them? Well, Dan Rather got tripped up that way, too. He thought he was going to take out George W. Bush, mm -hmm. with, with, but pounding on his his record in the, the, the Texas National Guard. Yeah, and they had that phony... Uh, yeah. Um, and it, it, he got caught up. He was. He was. It had the little print that comes up as THs and whatever. NDs. Yeah, they were able to. Yeah, they started doing an, uh, doing yeah. a Sherlock Holmes type analysis yeah, it, it, of the typewriters. His, his, <laughs> his defense was, well, just because that's the way, it doesn't mean it's not true. Yeah. I mean, it was just like, whoa, you just got caught, Bill. <laughs> it's incredible. And they come back for more. Did any of you catch that? I think it was just this weekend. Megan Kelly interviewing that fellow who denies the, the Oklahoma City massacre and I I, I I never heard the outcome I heard them talking about the on the radio I hadn't I don't I didn't watch her program but but uh, yeah she interviewed some fellow that forget his name to totally. some extent denies that the, uh, the 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 massacre actually took place that Sandy Hook was that the way it was oh, called that's Sandy, too, Sandy yeah. Hook and the Oklahoma City bombing. Oh, is yeah. this the Megyn Kelly? Uh, yeah. yeah, she interviewed. About? Okay. Oh, was well, she going for freak stuff or what? Well, the premise was <laughs> that she was presenting this guy as a mainstream conservative, as a way of. Oh yeah, yeah, As yeah, a way yeah, of, yeah. in other words, you, sh you mm -hmm. show some some guy who has has the totally face of off the wall opinions, and somebody who I think Trump said some positive things about. Yeah, so, so present yeah, him yeah, as yeah. as a typical mm -hmm. conservative. It did yeah. come out that way, though. Yeah, I didn't hear. I wish I had heard. But I always thought that she was a midstream conservative. Yeah, I think she was a good actor. But well, they that's all are. That's my reason. opinion. Yeah. A reader. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Talking heads, they call Talking something? Talking heads, yeah. <laughs> news readers, yeah, they call them news readers. Yeah. I'm nice just thinking well. of the uh, 68 Democratic Convention right now. Um, Walter Cronkite says, there's a bunch of thugs around here <laughs> yeah. when they were escorting yeah. Dan Rather yeah, out of Dan the Rather auditorium. You don't, you don't get that drama anymore. I wish you <laughs> yeah. did. Yeah. Or, or the mayor. <laughs> oh, yeah. Dan Rather. Now, here, okay. Shouting faker. I personally know this guy. 
Jim McKittrick, was was he retired Faker, as a police yeah, sergeant. He was, Faker. He was, he was saying something else. on video. Dan Rather was wanting to get by somewhere. He's an Andy Frayne Usher, tall, thin kid just That's out of the wrong. service. Yeah. He starts fighting with him there. He Rather started it. You know, He says, uh, throwing him the sissiest punch he ever had. But anyway, really? uh, of course, it was the advice uh, it was the op opposite, according to Mr. Cronkite. You know. And what about uh, Rather with his, uh, well, we're just talking about it. Being under, you no, know, with his, what did he say? Oh, it was a little print. Oh, well, yeah, when yeah. he was questioning uh, Bush's record in the, the Texas. Oh. It wasn't 60 Air minutes caught with phoning up some test results on cars or something, crashes. Do you remember that? Uh, Vaguely, yeah. 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 So, uh, I mean, if you can't believe it, you know, you can't believe it. Who else do we have? We're not oh, here yeah. to create. Disorder, we're here to preserve it. Well, that was Mayor Dillon. That's Daly. Mayor Dillon. Yeah, yeah, the police are not here to create disorder. The police are here to preserve, preserve disorder. disorder. <laughs> <laughs> and he should know because yeah, these, the these pension right? problems we have right now. Yeah. I'm tired of your right insinuendos. You're insinuendos. You're insinuendos. Here, here. Yeah. What did you say? I say, Mayor Daly, you can trace all of our problems now with with the pension, the police, the fire. Mm. Ooh. Uh, teachers' pensions, you can trace that, that go back right to back wow. to Richard yeah. J. Daly. I thought, and I before. Thought, Absolutely. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, I thought that started yeah. later. Yeah. They, what they were doing, and it was done for years, they take the money when, when X number of dollars comes in, supposed to be for your pension or mine, whatever. Yep. They take it and they use it. They like just it. Wait. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Then when you retire, they put you know, put it in. Instead of yeah. They put it in earlier and it was invested, correct? Yep. Go through the ceiling. We had a guy now. We I called it skimming. Yeah. Mm. When you give government money, they are going to spend it. I mean, yeah. that's what government yeah. does. They yeah. spend money. They're not going to put it aside and invest I'm, it. I'm sure that uh, you remember the name of George Gannon, Captain Bill, yeah. George Gannon, Bill, uh, Police Department. Now, oh, he made it up to the ranks like anybody else. But all of a sudden, he uh, got himself elected to be, he was the only active uh, uh, annuitant, you know, an active, active member of the pension rep. And uh, he was uh, ca caused a few problems because they wanted to have little secret meetings. And he said, wait a minute, time out here. We can't have a secret meeting here. There's such a thing called the Illinois Open Meetings Act. If you do this, I'm going to take you and you and you over to the district and book you. <laughs> so, so eventually they got the law changed, whereas uh, annuitants who were uh, they said below the rank of sergeant or inferior to had a rep. The sergeants had a rep. The lieutenant's captains had a rep in addition to the retirees. So now, it's all divided. They got the people they wanted. They knocked Gannon out of the box. Back to business as normal, as you said. And he goes he goes back even beyond daily, though, don't you think? Hmm. Could it could be. Yeah. It could be. But uh, we give nine and an eighth yeah. of our salary right, for right. our pension. Yeah. And uh, we were always under, and the, that's the way the law stood, was that money was to be put away and uh, and we had we hired yeah. people to uh, invest it. As, as you know, uh, you're talking about millions and millions what and millions what of dollars. Okay. So what yeah. they did, they took this money, the city, use it, and they used it on uh, whatever programs. Yeah. Right. Programs. Well, how did they ever get away to begin with by not paying the pensions? I mean, <laughs> they did it <laughs> by not paying the pensions. Well, I mean, they should have. What, what the, I, they oh, collected they the, the money eventually. Yeah, eventually. Yeah. What, eventually, I, yeah. what I think, big did city. Did they pay all of it that they were supposed to in one year? It's just no. way back. Uh, nobody, nobody has gone without a pension. No, but what I'm saying is they collect money for pensions, right? Right. Well, when did they stop taking that money for the pensions and not paying for the pensions? They keep it. When John Ryan retired or Bill yeah. Kugelman retired, then they'll put the money in. Not as it was yeah. coming. Am I right? Yeah. Here, right? Here's another thing that I think is way what big cities did. If they give you a pay increase now, they've got to pay you right now. They've right. got to find that money now. They've got to raise taxes now to pay you that, and they don't want to do that. So instead of giving you a pay increase now, they'll give you a small pay increase, and they'll promise you a big pension increase down the road. Right. By the time it comes to pay that pension, they, they figure no they're going to be gone. No Somebody no else will be in, in these offices, right. and they'll be left yep. holding the bag. So let them worry about finding right. the money to pay it. And here, that's that's part here, of Let me give you a little more thing. One, one more and thing. And they from borrow. Right. Yeah. yeah. They borrow. That's why their mm -hmm. their uh, class now is going down the tubes. Mm -hmm. and I think on a state level, we can blame Ogilvy and Thompson for yeah. running this problem. But they're yeah. borrowing yeah. money now to run the system. Before they used to just borrow money for a street or a sewer. 
now they're borrowing for, money. For day to day, just for routine expenses. Yeah. And for yeah. paying the debt that they owe for all the previous expenses. Right. That or part of the debt. The way it was explained is like this. I remember this, said, and this is George Gannon again in a meeting. He says to the guys, how much of the city's money goes into your pension? And the answer is none because it's not their money to begin with. They're empowered to collect it yeah. mm. for the pension yeah. fund, but it's not, not, the, that, not that at all. Let me give you a thought. You know, we all can remember when interest rates were about 5%. I mean, it was customary if you went to the bank and deposited yeah. money, interest rates were about 5%. Treasury bills paid you roughly 4 or 5%. We've had interest rates for almost zero for the last eight or nine right. years. Yeah. But they're starting to creep up now. Every time the Federal Reserve Board meets right. their rate, what happens when interest rates go back up to a historic level of 5%? We have a $20 trillion debt, national debt in the United States. If we have to pay 5% interest on that debt, that's a trillion dollars a year. So in addition to what the deficit is for ordinary expenses, they're going to have to come up with another trillion dollars just to pay the interest on that. There's no way they can do it. And when that happens, the national debt is going to start going up, you know, like a skyrocket. Mm. And we wind up, you wind up where Greece is today, where the country is just broke. You owe so much money, yeah. you can't Bread pay costs it. $100 There's no way you can pay it. Right. And that, if we don't do something, and like I say, for the last 10 years, we've been able to ignore this because interest rates have been zero. So you didn't have to worry about right. paying yeah. interest on it. When, it. when it gets back to a level where it becomes a problem, we're going to really have to decide how we're going to deal with it. I remember one the tail end of uh, that clip, uh, just before, uh, there was interest rates of like 15%. Oh, God, yeah. Carter, yeah. Right. Yeah. Car Car Carter, right. Yeah. Carter. and Oh, yeah, sure. And I bought a, I don't know, $10,000 CD. Yeah, they were paying you 15%. Sure. And time. about a year or two later, well, we'll give you an iron if you cash it yeah, in. Yeah, sure. And, <laughs> I, and they kept on. He yeah. says... Well, what what will it take for you to cash in your thing? I said, well, give me all the interest due at the end of <laughs> maturity. We can't do that. I said, I got a long time. I'll wait. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, one more thing about the uh, talking about these pensions, like uh, Bill, you said you're nine plus percent. You pay I the same thing. I I got a terrible shock because I was getting to what they call at max. The maximum was like 32 years at the time, I believe. I said, ah, great, I've got all that extra dough. Well, they don't. They keep on taking it. Yep. That's part of the law, too. They keep on taking it from you after you've hit max, maximum, you know, so. So why keep working after you hit maximum? That's what I said to myself all of a sudden. <laughs> Stay for a while, about two or three years more. And but, they uh, change it. They keep changing it. Well, yeah, I, that? during my uh, uh, time on, I came under three different pension plans. They kept reducing the number of years or so? Yep. Yeah. Yep. 5323 was the big thing when I. Uh, 5323, 5320, 5320. Yeah, 63. Uh, 63. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. No. 63. What is? No. 53 or 63? 63. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. 63 for what? I mean. You have to go. You have to go. Oh, you've got to go. Yeah, yeah but I mean, you can go. Maximum. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. 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 They were doing that. Yeah, obviously it was yeah. political clout. Okay. Some guy who's on for six months and I'm a policeman. And municipalities, like, I don't know if it was the cops or firemen, two months out of the year they would give them a 10% raise for that one month, hoping they would retire on that month so they would get a little better pension. Not us. Yeah, I've never heard of that. Not us. i never heard there of that. There was one, no. believe me. You got a 3% uh, after you retire. Well, there was a certain percentage. With that. Uh, mm -hmm. They're trying to catch up. In fact, there's a federal lawsuit now uh, that's uh, being heard. That's uh, politics. Right. Mm -hmm. Speaking of politics, you see the first Bush, he just turned 92 years old. George H.W. Bush. Right. When he was president, they just called him George. You never heard the term H.W. when he no. was president. It was just George Bush. Right. It was only when it was to well, differentiate from his son that he became George H.W. Bush. Yeah. In those days, he probably had the Texas Rangers, so that was what was going on. <laughs> George Herbert yeah. Walker Bush. They didn't want to call him Junior then. I can remember when, when Democrats used to love calling him George George Herbert Walker Bush because they thought it made him sound like a New England aristocrat, a preppy. <laughs> But I can remember those same Democrats were furious if you referred to Barack Hussein Obama. Mm. 
Yeah. That was terrible right. to use yeah. his middle name. You uh, were uh, trying yeah. to discredit him by using They didn't mind uh, Jay Danforth Quayle. Oh, no, that was that. Or Richard Mill. I used to love saying uh -huh. Richard Milhouse yeah. Nixon because it was such an unusual Who name. Who was the guy running? He was the vice president running for president. He did the potato chips commercials. Potato chip commercials? Yes. Yeah. That's not Quayle insisting potato is spelled with an E at the end. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah he, that was, and that was Quayle. Super Bowl, again, yeah. He was doing uh, a Jay's potato chip commercial. I, 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 I remember like, doing commercials. I, I know he got, huh. he got, and that was, that was a set That was a too. spilling bay, bay or something. Like the, report, the, the teacher gave him yeah. an E at the end is the correct answer. It's the teacher correct. handed <laughs> him a card <laughs> with potato spelled with an E. Oh, that's true. Yeah. And yeah. then when he, when he said exactly what they the... They were all over Then all the press <laughs> made him out to be a boo. And then he yeah. did the, the potato chip commercial at the I didn't know that. I missed that, that part. Oh, yeah, afterward. Yeah. Y years I, later. It was yeah. a Super Bowl. Made yeah. a buck on it, yeah. <laughs> you made it sound like it was during that year. <laughs> he was from what, Indiana? Indiana, yeah. Indiana. yeah. yeah. Now that I got a vice president from Jay Indiana. Danforth. Remember Boyle. William F. Buckley Jr. always saying oh, okay. Lyndon Baines. Yes. Lyndon Johnson. Baines. Like Johnson. that was a derogatory. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> Lyndon. Well, there's a guy. I mean, uh, LBJ. Uh, everybody loved LBJ, right? He was a high school I teacher and wound up at yeah. the LBJ Ranch. Yeah. I was a poor boy on the Pernalis yeah. River Valley yeah. who is now your king. Yeah. He, um, <laughs> um, it's something with. Um, I guess what we're learning now is we're supposed to hate people who made their fortune before they get in office. Yeah. Hmm. We're supposed to love them. It's perfectly all right to make a fortune while you're in office. You're, right? yeah. you're in office. Or actually, now anytime you make a fortune, wow. but well, it's a lot harder though. Yeah. It must be. Well, that, well to, to there's a certain attitude that seems to be very widespread that if if I've made X number of dollars and whatever it was successful, I must have. So we say been nasty to others below, cheated them. I was going to say screwed, but... Well, you uh, know, the, the Lyndon Johnson, I don't believe Lyndon Johnson ever had a private job in his life. I don't think he was... He was on the public so. payroll from the time he started right. out as a school teacher. And then he became he became a legislator. And a, I'm not sure if he was in the... I don't know. No, I think his dad served in the legislature. He was in the House. He, in, in the United States House. I don't yeah. know if he ever served in the oh. Texas legislature. And I think he his wife had that radio station. He was, he was, he was an aide. That's right. Yeah. He was an aide to a congressman. Then he became a congressman and a senator and majority leader and vice president. And he winds up a multimillionaire. On gov How do you do it on government salaries? He was making $10,000, dollars 25000 a year. How do you wind up a millionaire With the LBJ ranch owning a ranch yeah. and radio stations and all of that? And nobody ever asked that. I nobody think ever got some of that through his wife. Who was that from? He wasn't rich. Well, she was in the radio station. It was in her name. Oh, it was okay. in her name. Yeah, people okay. just say, "Oh, that was his wife." Yeah, he had the, he had these assets in her name. Oh, but she didn't. She didn't come from a landed family or anything oh, like okay. that. Who was the CEO of Bell and Howe? Chuck Ooh. Percy. Chuck, yeah. and he, you know, Chuck Percy. He must have been making a ton of money at Bell and Howe, yeah. and he oh, gives yeah. that up to become the governor. Senator. Senator. He ran for governor, but lost. Oh, okay. Yeah, he ran yeah, he for made, governor, but lost. Senate. against Paul. Oh, Dunn, he, well, he, he did in in high in college. He was uh, already thinking. Wherever it was, was the University of Chicago he went to? I, I don't know. Wherever it was, they had all these fraternity houses. He went to some company. Cole comes in and says, if I get you all all of the fraternity houses contract, not just one. He wanted a certain percentage. And he got this on a long-term deal. So whatever it was, the deal was on the same price. Okay. And he did get it. So here he was in his class. So he was an operator. Yeah, yeah. Nothing wrong with that. He was no, no, wrong. No, no, nothing wrong, wrong with that at all. Yeah. Wrong with that. Yeah, I met, I met, I did meet Chuck Percy. I he was, uh, I had the opportunity to escort his wife. Mm -hmm. She came to visit our town hall once when mm -hmm. he was running for office, and she was doing photo and interviews with the press. And they picked me to be her escort, so I took her around and showed her the police station and the firehouses and everything like that. And she was wonderful, wonderful lady. Mm -hmm. And when I went to Washington not long after that. Percy had invited me to come to his office, and he took time. He took time to, you know, to spend with me and talk to me about my career in politics. Right, right. And so, I mean, I came away from it with a very positive image of, of, of Senator Percy. He was a very engaging fellow, and, and it, very often when you do something and they promise you, the, the promise is forgotten once the election is over. Right. I'm busy. But no, when I came to Washington, oh, he made time for me. It was fine. Hmm. Spent about a half an hour with me, you know, which for a United Very States good. senator is is a, a, a goodly time, yeah. chunk of time. Yeah. Now we had an alderman in where my grandmother used to live. In fifty-one years, fifty-one weeks of the year, he didn't know you. <laughs> <And> one week <laughs> uh, he was oh your yeah. buddy. Yeah. That's your typical alderman. And uh, 
after the election, he didn't know you again. We knew, well, there was a fellow that served on our school board many years ago, and when, when he would show up at a, uh, at a, uh, any place, people would say, oh, must, you must be up for election this year. Because <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> yeah, yeah. they, they, had, they had six-year terms, school board. We never see you five years. <laughs> when, when, when we, this must be the year for you're running for re-election. <laughs> what, what was, was his the, reaction? The, the and movie he, he knew it was true. He, there's not much he could say. It was true. It was that movie ten or twelve years ago, or maybe more now, with um, uh, what's her name's brother um, Warren Beatty's in it, called oh. Bullworth. Right. Uh, I've never and he comes out and says, "I don't know what you're paying." You. He says people what he was telling them was on BS anyway, right from the microphone. But that was a good, almost case of art imitating life in that sense. Was uh, telling the but truth. He was being honest. Yeah. Politicians. Yeah. You know. Weren't they going to re-examine uh, the death of Charles Percy's daughter? And I haven't heard anything more about there that. There was something uh, in the news yeah. recently about that. Just very I recently, know. I really? heard something about it. Which I thought, God, that's so. That's in the 1960s. Well, he's passed on, isn't he? Did they ever? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 He's gone. Yeah. Did they ever find her body? Yeah, I'm sure. Oh, I I'm sure they did. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Her body oh. was. Yeah, she was. Oh, that missing. was the Brocks. Brock. Oh yeah. Helen, no, Brock. Yeah. Yeah. Helen, Helen Brock. Oh, Helen Brock. Yeah. There was something in the news just a few yeah, I I months up, ago I, I about, more about Percy it, yeah. Yeah. killing, and I, but I don't, I don't recall what. Mm. But in all fairness, it seems to be human nature. We have, we have a tendency to want to believe conspiracy or outlandish oh, yeah. Yeah. things yeah. happening. Am I, am I right? You know. We, oh we, God, yeah. There are people who still believe that that the story of Lincoln's assassination was was covered up, and that Pearl Harbor, the FDR knew Pearl about Harbor, yeah. Pearl Harbor, and. I mean, there's, there's not people who believe that we didn't really land, America didn't really land on mm -hmm. the moon, that it was all staged in a studio. Well, and and people I talked to uh, today, like uh, it was all fake. With the, uh, uh, the United States was the ones who destroyed the, the World the Trade Twin Center. Towers. Yeah, there yeah. are people, uh, there's something about human nature, they want to believe that there's something mm -hmm. crooked out there. That there are these deep secrets that are hidden and that there are these powerful people out there that know what... I guess it's just, they're just people who, who... It makes them feel better to think that... That what we see is not the truth. That there's really this dark truth behind everything. Mm -hmm. I know there's some too about uh, a theory about uh, uh, John Kennedy Jr.'s plane being uh, no, <laughs> assassinated or whatever you know put put down like mm -hmm. that. I heard it argued that the greatest conspiracy in American history is after Woodrow Wilson's stroke. How his wife Edith Bowling basically that. was acting president well, of the United States well, for a couple that's of years. That's true. I mean, that is really true. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I don't think any, that, that I don't doesn't go to the conspiracy that. level, right? I don't know right, anyone right, that right. denies that. Yeah, nobody's denying that. That, sh that she was was the, the doorkeeper. Yeah. No one got to see him without her permission, right. and the decisions were essentially being made by her. He was still alive, but but he was in no position to actually carry out his duties oh, as president. What's her name? Uh, Congolese Rice. The first After woman president. for a while, they said she was pretty much running the government. Hmm. Who says when Bush was flying around that? in the plane, no. oh. she was telling them. Tell them who? Uh, Interesting. <laughs> Bush. She wasn't married to the president, was she? No, no. she wasn't even Secretary of State when yeah, that she happened. Wasn't. She was, she, no, she didn't. At that point? Colin know. Powell was the Secretary well, of okay, State. Okay, what was her? She was, she was National Security Advisor. Yeah, okay. Yeah. She may have been in contact with yeah, him, but the idea that she was making any decisions—they had some kind of thing—and he was. He, uh, she was on the phone, and she says, "No, Mr. President, you can't do that. I'm not going to let you." Hmm. That's I, well, I, I, that that doesn't sound plausible. They, they they decided not to take Bush back to Washington sure. immediately because they didn't know what, how there might be more. Planes, or might be more. Well, more yeah, of a sure. You don't know what's going on. It was better to have the president at a safe location where they can protect him rather than fly him back to Washington. Not even sure where a safe location is at a time like that. Well, but you take he was taken to an air force. No, place, I'm just I saying think. you don't know. Yeah, somewhere so in. I th did he go to SAC headquarters? I'm not sure yeah, where I he think went. So in the, in he might mind. have gone to SAC headquarters yeah. at first, but Omaha, but uh, yeah. but it, it made sense not to fly him right back to Washington D.C. Right. when you've just had two planes right. attacking Washington D.C. Yeah. And the Pentagon, planes. yeah, yeah. Pentagon, and the one that the one that they think was headed for either the Capitol or the White House, the one that went down in Pennsylvania. I wonder there. if flying a plane, like, I think the White House would have been kind of hard to find because that's a pretty small building. It is hard to find. I know a, go a good comparison I can think of is in right after uh, Pearl Harbor, they were no, we weren't, we weren't, our side wasn't sure what was happening. Was there an invasion going on? You know, was there an invasion oh, sure. imminent right there in, in uh, 
Hawaii. Well, you've seen the movie, you know, and from here to eternity, where they're all out on yeah. the the GIs are all yeah. out on the beach with rifles and, yeah. and and cartridge belts, expecting to repel an invasion. Right. Yeah. No one knew what was the the no. next step right. was going to be. No. But the Japanese kind of screwed up too. They didn't hit fuel systems or fuel tanks, and there was another thing they didn't hit. The repair, the repair, repair the repair docks, and right. the repair areas, and the, and <laughs> yeah, the repair docks. But the, the the repair facilities <laughs> and and the the uh, the fuel uh, right. depot. But their decision was they'd had a big success. Get out while the getting is good. Yeah. They were afraid that if they went back for another bite. They didn't know what might come their way. That might right. give the Americans. They, 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 there were two American carriers out there. They didn't there know where they, where they were. They right. were. Yeah. You still wonder why the commanding general and commanding admiral were court martialed for you know yeah. incompetence. Mm-hmm. They were receiving yeah. little yeah, information. They t- I think they were like a. They were. Seven. They were essentially Escape carrying out the orders degree. that they'd been given. Right. We will be right back after these messages of interest and importance. Well, friends, now is the time to think about your roof, siding, and gutters on your home or place of business. We could have some heavy rainstorms in the next few months. So be sure the roof, siding, and gutters are in good shape. You don't want mold or mildew in your attic or crawl space or drip, drip, drip on your ceilings in your rooms or have your walls damaged by a leaky gutter or by bad siding. So don't have double expense. Sooner or later, you're going to have to have it repaired. So call Best Brothers Roofing, Siding, and Gutters at 630-616-1359. Mike Besh will drive over in a shiny red truck with ladders on top, and Mike will look over your roof, siding, and gutters and give you an estimate and go from there. So don't have double expense. Call Besh Brothers Roofing, Siding, and Gutters for a free estimate at area code 6. 630-616-1359. That's Best Brothers Roofing, Siding, and Gutters at area code 630-616-1359. Don't have double expense. Call Best Brothers Roofing for a free estimate. And once again, their number is area code 630-616-1359. Call today. Now, back to our discussion. For those of you who have television, you can see how our discussion continued during the break. But on the one other hand, we're not on television, so knock it off. And this is strictly a radio operation right now. Maybe someday. What do you think, gang? They said I have the face for radio. <laughs> oh, we all do. No? I concur. Yeah. I always say that that, uh, that the fellow to the left of me has a great voice for radio. You know, there, there's an area we are uh, not thinking much of. Was uh, Since the end of World War II has been a, a trouble spot. It was in Korea. Now we see that emerging, re-emerging as a really hot spot. Korea. In, uh, the, uh, w- what would you have a history in Korea that uh, we want to look at or... or I know it was part of the Japanese Empire for a right. long time. It bl- yeah, J- it was not, chosen. Not that long. It, it, it 1910, I believe. Japan took it in 1910 and then yeah. lost it at the end of World War II. It was divided. That was part of the, you know, the Russians, you know, uh, declare war on Japan after the first atomic bomb mm-hmm. has been dropped, and they come in and grab mm-hmm. the Sakhalin mm-hmm. Islands in the north. And they but grab in all North fairness, Korea. they were fighting an undeclared war there before with the Japanese and over that way. Not no, not during not during war. They fought an oh, undeclared yeah. in the thirties. They yeah, fought okay. not yeah. during the war. Yeah. Stalin was yeah. Stalin didn't do anything hostile mm-hmm. toward the Japanese during the war. Mm-hmm. American pilots that that came down, like the the pilots from uh, 
uh, various raids. Uh, he was he was very reluctant to, to release them because he didn't want to antagonize the Japanese. Uh, they yeah they fought an undeclared war with the Japanese in the 30s, not during World War II. But the, the Japan took Korea in 1910, and then lost it at the end of World well, War II, and the Russians the, uh, got half of it. Th there was a Russian. Ja Russo-Japanese War around that time that Theodore Roosevelt intervened. 1904, uh, 1905. Intervened, he, uh, he got the Nobel. Mediated. He received the Nobel Peace Prize. He brought their ambassadors to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Right. And Theodore Roosevelt brokered a peace agreement between the Russians and the Japanese. Was this Sakhalin Island was partly uh, cut up or something? Or? That, uh, mm. well, the... Wait. I'm trying to think. The Sakhalin Islands were in Japanese hands. They may have... Been, I don't know the history of that. They might have okay. that might have been partially Russian before the war, and they lost it. It was half that, that, then That's possible. World and War II, after it became all Russian, they, they took the the remaining half of yeah. it from the Japanese. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the Japanese had really had had given a drubbing to the to the Russians in the war, and and the result of the negotiation was that Russia came out not as badly mm -hmm. as they might have thought they would have. A lot of people don't even stop and think about it, or know, or apparently aware. Japan was on the side of the Allies in, in World War One. World War One. Right. What they did mostly was grab a lot of German, German islands out there, yeah. and, and um, the they were setting stage yeah. for what they the had previously called their East Asian Co-Prosperity Theory uh, sphere. sphere. Greater, sphere, sphere. greater East, greater East Asia, Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere, which means the Japanese that, Empire. Basically. Yeah, yeah, it was another word, but th th that term didn't come up till the 30s. When the, when they were yeah. grabbing this stuff during World War One, they hadn't no. gone quite that far down the road. I, I, I know they had uh, originally had those islands under under mandates from the League of Nations. The League of Nations, so, yes. You no, know, folks, young folks, League of Nations <laughs> was the idea of Rose uh, Theodore. Uh, no, <laughs> try again. How about Woodrow? Woodrow? Thomas Woodrow Wilson, yeah. his idea, which we never got in on because uh, the Senate wouldn't ratify it. But right. it did It did operate in out of where? Uh, uh, the Switzerland. The oh, Geneva. Hague, Lua the Lua Geneva. I think it was Lausanne. Yeah. Maybe it was Lausanne. Versailles or Hague? No, no, it was in no. Switzerland. Their Switzerland? Head, headquarters in Switzerland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, they had this huge the Palace of Nations. They built this huge headquarters for the League of Nations in the 30s, which the UN inherited. When was that Palace of Versailles? No, 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 no. no, no, no. Versailles no. in France. That's, Way that's older. No. no, this this Versailles where the treaty was signed that right. ended World War One, but the League of Nations was headquartered in Switzerland, mm -hmm. and of course we never we never joined. Didn't at the Treaty of Versailles, didn't Speak they kind of turn their back on the Japanese a little bit too? Japan didn't think that they were treated with the respect that they were entitled to okay. at, at the, at the, at the, at, and the argument being, of course, well, what did Japan, what co contribution did they made to the war effort? There were no Japanese troops fighting the Germans in, on no, the Western they Front. They just grabbed, like you say, they grabbed, they, they, uh, what, grabbed what real estate they could get so. their hands on. And, okay. But they thought they were entitled to a much better uh, treatment at the, at the, they thought they were going to get more at right. the, at the Treaty of Versailles, and they didn't. Think that would have contributed some to the Second World War? Well, they were they were ticked off. Uh, the yeah. Japanese had been allied with Britain. They really yeah. they were their alliance was with Britain. Well, okay. after the First World War, Britain had to decide whether they wanted to maintain a strong relationship with Japan or with the United States because it was obvious that Japan and the United States were headed for rivalry. So it took the British about you know a millisecond to decide that they they their their future was in alliance with the United States and not with Japan. Right. So that was the end of this relationship mm -hmm. between Japan and and, and Great all Britain. bygones being bygones from the Revolution or whatever. We were English speaking. That's we right. We're from the same traditions oh. as, mm -hmm. uh, right. as the Brits. We yeah. um, you know the rapprochement between the United States and Britain goes away. I mean, you go back to the time of the Civil War, and already the British were understanding that their their future lay with the United States. Right. They weren't going to be suckered into a support for the for the South in the, in, the, in the Civil War. Sort of on that vein, what did Churchill do between the time he lost the election after the war and he got reelected? Was it painted 19, and wrote book, wrote books. He wrote a, wrote a history of the Second World War that that was a bestseller. I think he won a Pulitzer Prize for it. We um, were just talking earlier in the uh, the show about mentioned uh, uh, um, 
Victor, we'd see the American. Bum, bum, there was um, bum, Winston bum. Churchill, The Valiant Years, was the oh, series yeah. from like mm-hmm. 1960, right? Yeah, on 59, there. 60. I remember watching it. was that a co production yeah. of BBC and ABC. Yeah. With Richard Burton doing the words Spoke, of Winston yeah. Churchill. Oh, yeah. I don't I'm I surprised that hasn't surfaced again. That. You never remember see that? It. It's a great series. Win- uh, Richard Winston Rogers Churchill, also did the music for the that. Valiant Years was a documentary. It came on Sunday nights at 9 30. Wow. And it would be history of the Second World War. I think it was out against What's My Line. Yeah. I was allowed as a kid. I was allowed to stay up late to watch. I mean, that was past my regular bedtime. At that, I, mean, I was like nine or ten years old, ten oh, years old, and I was allowed to stay up late to watch that. The, mm-hmm. I would have been between five and ten years old. Supposedly. While we're talking about World War II, let me just give you one. Today is the anniversary of one of the decisive battles in the Pacific that hardly anyone has ever heard. Of. It's called the Battle of the Philippine Sea. On this date, the 19th of July, 1944, roughly two years after Midway. Everybody knows about Midway. Midway. It was known as something else. The Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. The Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. That's what I remember it is. The United U.S. shot down or, or otherwise destroyed over 400 Japanese aircraft with minimal losses right, and the right. Japanese right. lost three aircraft carriers yeah, at that the Philippines. Pretty much that was that was the now. end of the Japanese Navy. From there on in, Japan no longer had a sufficient sea force to really do much of anything in the Well that and the uh, the strategy of destroying their, their supply lines, not getting anything coming in and yeah. uh, they That's had a, they relied on uh, invading these places to get the rubber yeah. tin and whatever yeah. else they needed. And they were cut off. Yeah. But, I mean, two years after Midway, Midway's the turning point in the Pacific. The Philippine Sea is like the coup de grace. That's like the, that's like the final decisive blow that just destroyed her, her sea power in the Pacific. And the well, Japanese were never emphasized kamikaze fighting. Right. After yeah, after that, that yeah. Yeah. They, they still had a navy. They the still had man. ships. Yeah. But that was, the last, right. that was the last time they had a real seagoing battle fleet that, right. that was capable but of doing anything. After Midway, they never initiated a... Uh, Another offensive. They were never on the offensive. offensive. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. But anyway, today's the anniversary of the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. Mm. All these other places you hear of Okinawa, and Iwo Jima, and there was island hopping. Yeah. Well, that was towards wasn't the it? last of the war. That's 45. Yeah. I know that uh, I know Harry Truman, uh, uh, know from certain factions, gets a lot of, a lot of criticism for using the atomic bomb. But uh, as he said... They saved lives in the long sure. run because they sure. would have kept on fighting till oh, yeah. they, you know. Mm-hmm. Till they would have fought mm-hmm. to the last rock mm-hmm. on the the farthest right. island of the Japanese yeah. home islands. They would never have given in. Mm-hmm. There was till they were all dead. A program on when they dropped the atomic bomb. I don't know what year it was, but they had this little girl on there, and she says, "Why did why did they drop the the atomic bomb on those nice Japanese people?" <laughs> When they start, when we started the war, <laughs> we started the war. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's probably what she learned in school. That's right. probably what her teacher told mm-hmm. her. Well, yep. I keep arguing that if, if uh, Truman had made the decision not to use the A bomb, and the invasion of the Japanese homeland went on with a couple of million more killed, he could easily have been impeached. Yeah, and then suddenly for withholding the use of a weapon that could have hastened the end of the war. People yeah. find out we have this secret weapon that could have won the war okay. in mm-hmm. a single flash. And we didn't use it. Yep. How on earth would he have judged? Yeah. He, he would have been imp- not only would have been impeached. He might have been lynched. Uh, if, if I, uh, I think that you and I, you and I probably wouldn't be here, John, because our, our our dads would have been sent to the Pacific. Yeah. My oh. dad, my dad was 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 in the Sixth Infantry Division yeah. in the summer of 1945. He had they had landed and in, invaded the Philippines. He fought on the Bataan Peninsula. He was in the liberation of Manila, and his division was being refitted in preparation for the invasion of the Japanese home islands. He would have been in Operation Coronet, set for March of 1946. What did they call it? Coronet. Coronet? Coronet. Yeah, okay, yeah. that's what I thought you said. They Olympic was the invasion of the island of Kyushu, which was the, the southern southernmost of, of the main four home islands. That was set for the fall of 45. Coronet was the invasion of Honshu, the main mm. island my dad's division was going to land between Mount. Sur- they they they've declassified the plans for Operation Coronet a few years ago, and I got a copy of the maps. His division was going to land between Mount Suribachi and the city of Yokohama, and their objective was Tokyo. His divisions was part of the force that would have right. marched on Tokyo. Yeah. So can you imagine how the Jap? They fought for those volcanic rocks like Iwo Jima. 
right. Suribachi, wasn't that a, an Iwo Jima? Your sacred, no, Suribachi. Uh, I'm Suribachi. sorry, Mount Fujiyama. Fujiyama. Forgive, yeah, Mount, Fujiyama Mount, yeah. forgive me, Mount Fujiyama. Fujiyama. Mount Fuji, as they often yeah, call right. it. Didn't now, they estimate the the fatalities or the losses oh, of they, about they, a million? They, they thought American oh. dead would have been in the hundreds of thousands. Oh, okay. And Every so often you hear the argument, we simply could have just starved out the Japanese. Don't invade them, but they're not getting any food. They have virtually no Air Force or right. Navy, so they would just surrender because they would starve to death. Is that a better way of defeating the Japanese Empire? I don't know. I don't know. The question is, how many people would have starved? How long would it have taken? They, yeah. who, there again. The, the civilians would, would have starved, but what food That's they it. had would have been would have been allocated. And they had, they had something like a million soldiers. They the, Japan, while they had been driven back and defeated everywhere else in their empire, they had something like a million troops garrisoning the home islands, and yeah, they were right. training women and kids to fight with sharpened sticks yep. and yeah, with right, Molotov right. cocktails. Mm -hmm. The other problem is that once the war was over in Europe. Stalin would have invaded Japan. And if we had not done something to end the war, you could have wound up with the mm -hmm. Russians. And they, they Russians wouldn't Stalin wouldn't have cared how many million men it took yeah. if the if the final result would have right. been that, that Russia yeah. would have occupied. Even after his casualties against Hitler. But he he wouldn't have cared how many right. men it, it he had then to sacrifice. Berlin and Tokyo. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But on the other hand, yeah. I heard after the occupation, the American occupation of Japanese or Japan, went very well. They got along oh, God, with oh the yeah. civilians very well. Japanese MacArthur is to be credited for his policies. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Keeping the emperor on as a figurehead. Absolutely. Right. And they would have. They would have fought. I mean, if they, if they if they had tampered with the emperor, then they would have fought. I mean, they were they right. they considered the emperor to be a god. Right. But they quickly realized that the Americans were not the barbarians that they had been told. Right. They had their propaganda had said the Americans were going to rape and loot and pillage and destroy. They didn't do that. They, did, they might, didn't do any of that. We might be a bunch of knuckleheads, but we're not barbarian. We're barbaric not, yeah, we weren't yeah. Russians. I mean, yeah. <laughs> we weren't going to behave the way the Soviets behaved when they, when they occupied oh. Germany. Berlin, and it quickly Russia became Germany. obvious that the American, you know, when, when, when MacArthur landed, when he goes in to land in Tokyo, they, they, the uh, they were the quartermaster was issuing them pistol belts what? to all the officers. Pistol belts, you know, right. forty fives and cartridge belts. And MacArthur says, "I'm not going to carry that." He says, "If they're going to attack us, these will be useless. They'll have rifles and machine right, guns." Right. And he says, "He says the Japanese will be much more impressed if we arrive unarmed. They will realize they have lost the war. That it isn't necessary for us to carry sidearms." And that was the beginning of the, of the Americans presenting themselves in such a way right. that the Japanese knew we weren't going to come there and massacre them the way they had been told we would. Oh, do you want to say something? I was going to say, one thing that brings to mind right now about the Japanese culture and the people, adaptability. I think it was in 1871 we kind of opened up Japan to the West with the... Uh, our, you know, came with Hazard the, Perry. That was within a, within years 30 years, years they had a steel yeah. fleet... They had modern, you know, modern uh, weaponry. They had, um, you know, well, obviously, <laughs> had some ideas too there. But they, but you, they, you know, the Japanese in, in the latter part of the nineteenth century, they 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 studied the German army and mm -hmm. the British navy. Mm -hmm. They they their analysis was that the Germans were were they had the greatest army in Europe, and Britain clearly oh, had the greatest yeah. navy. That's right. So they patterned their two services. The, the the Japanese navy was patterned after the Royal Navy in many right. ways. One more thing they had. American baseball. Oh yeah, mm. baseball. Yankee baseball. Good point. And yeah, cricket. Man. Did you ever hear? There was a famous tour that went in, probably in the early '30s or Babe Ruth. Ruth and a whole bunch of people. Uh, of course, they knew him as Baba Russo, and mm -hmm. they, you know, everybody knew who the Babe was. They also sent a guy named Mo Berg, a kind of a <laughs> journeyman catcher. But Mo spoke like seven, eight languages, and Mo uh, was a little, did a little intelligence work for the uh, U.S. the OSS at the time. I guess it was, huh? Was that OSS then? Or that OSS, and, yeah, during World War II, yeah, yeah. the OSS, yeah. The Office but of Strategic was, uh, Services. It was quite a, quite a guy, quite a story on someone like it. There's a few few people uh, that could make a pretty good biography, but Mo Berg would be one. Hmm. Another one to me would be um, a guy named uh, Joe Savoldi was a uh, Notre Dame football player who got canned because he, got, he was married and wound up, found out through a divorce. It was against Notre Dame regulations, so he went to the pros. He played a little for the Bears and had his own team, barnstorming team, for a while. But he also got into pro wrestling later. But in between, another OSS guy, he was born somewhere in central Italy, 
brought her as a young kid, so he spoke fluently. He was brought into the, uh, smuggled into Italy as an operative there in World War II, you know, as a native. And that would be one, that would be one, one guy. Would never yeah. seen him. George Rogers Clark would be another. Oh. The, the brother of uh, the other Clark. Who was the Clark? Lewis and Clark? Lewis and Clark. Mm -hmm. George Rogers. Oh, no. you're, ta George you're talking about, you're talking about. Uh, it was Mary, Mary, Mary Weather Lewis. Mary Weather yeah. Lewis. And uh, yeah. Clark Kent. No, they Clark Kent. went down to the, the Splains River I can't think of his first name. George something. Rogers Clark was, it was, it was. The brother was the, was his yeah. brother George Rogers yeah, Clark. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. was like almost individually responsible responsible for getting the Northwest Territory, what it was called then. Oh yeah. Ohio, Indiana, yeah. Michigan, yeah. Illinois, yeah, Wisconsin. With a very small the great force Northwest people. Territory. Yeah, it was it was ceded ceded to us at the uh, in the in the settlement with Britain. Yeah. Well, it had been French territory. Yeah. And uh, uh, one story was he they came to was it Vincennes <coughs> or some town, and they they'd taken it. And the local priest, a Jesuit, came to him. He said, uh, "The people want to know. Well, when, he, when we are interned, will the men and women be separated?" And he said, <laughs> "Interned? Not be interned. You're, you're free. You know. Say so one. This is the land of the free and the home he, of the brave. Yeah. He won the people over. The sentiment that way. Yeah. So Which of the Clarks invented the candy bar? What? The Clark oh. bar? That was a different. What did he do? He wanted to know which Clark, Clark bar. invented the Clark, the Clark bar. The Clark bar. Oh yes, Clark Bar. <laughs> Remember the, okay. Remember the the commercials? I oh, I want the, the 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 talking uh, be a camel, camel. Yeah. Right. or a camel or yeah. something. Oh, I want a Clark Bar. Yeah, those are, you don't even see Clark Bars in this area. I wrote so something. Pick up on one of your points, Jack. Was baseball pretty big in Japan before World War Two? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Was oh, yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not just a post-war phenomenon. Yeah. They played baseball oh, in yeah. the thirties. Yeah. Well, the Japanese might have seen this was an American game. Oh, so but, not but, but during the war, evil. it was banned. Oh, yeah, the government, the government okay. banned it in Japan yeah. because of the fact that really? this was an evil American ah, import. Okay. Yeah, I know okay. the Japanese brought it to, to Taiwan Japanese and uh, Korea. You know, yeah. places they, they did. Oh, oh, I didn't know that. Korea. Yeah, it was banned yeah, during the war. Of course, we banned sumo also here, didn't we? <laughs> the same time. I always like to say, you know, they always talk about how baseball continued. When we're in the baseball season now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, base, there was some talk that baseball might be suspended during World War II. Right. right. And the story is that the commissioner of baseball wrote to President Roosevelt asking, you know, what do you wish? And FDR responded that, the, you know, the great American game of baseball must continue to give our people hope and something to enjoy a good game after they're working in the war industries. They'll be able to go to a ball game. But I always say there was another there was another secret motive for keeping baseball going that FDR, as a mm. wise commander in chief, knew. Because if we hadn't kept baseball going during the war, how would they have identified the German infiltrators right. at the Battle of the Bulge oh, yeah. if they couldn't yeah. ask them who won the World Series last yeah, year? Was so, and so. Right. so that was FDR was thinking ahead. Well, <laughs> baseball during the war was mostly women's though, wasn't it? No, 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 no. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, that was no, the heyday no. of the. They uh, had that league. league. No, they they played. No, yeah. the, yeah. the major uh, leagues continued. Remember Harlem and Garfield or Harrison, whatever. There was a league. Because men, you know, best uh, there was, players there were was drafted, uh, of course. What was they call that? Wrigley. I think it was P.K. Was it P.K. or, or is it was a rock hole of stadium? Wrigley uh, that originated that that girls' baseball during the war. Fillins. 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 Yeah. yeah, yeah and Fillins the, Stadium. There was, yeah. There's yeah. another stadium where it was all women at Harlem and yeah. Garfield. Well, yeah. Channel 9 had women's softball on television in the early 50s. I vaguely recall. Yeah. Seeing that. Yeah. Last Saturday evening. I said, Dad, those aren't baseball players. Those are ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Son, you're growing up. Well, I was a little guy. But <laughs> oh, so but, uh, when are they going to break into the major leagues, league. though? Pardon? When well, are women going to break into the, the major leagues? First woman major league player, eh? Yeah. Well, well, we love to see that. Well, I want to break into there. Since I feel, I feel, I feel stressed, uh, gen uh, my transgender, so I want to get into one of their softball leagues. <laughs> How about that? They're going to let me play. When we're talking about, um, we just said before about Recognizing or being able to tell who they were at the Battle of the Bulls or somewhere, that picture. It's always the standard question: is they always ask them no. a baseball question when they're, not, when they're not sure. Battleground. About Battleground. Yeah. Very, very one of the best pictures I think, along with a few others. But they 
they're they, they're trying to see are these really Americans? Are they fall who who won the World Series? Who does who does Betty Grable going to be married? <laughs> what so is what where they trip up? I think it's in a major where they trip him up and they ask him is what is a Texas leaguer? He didn't know, but he wasn't. He, he didn't know he was an American. He didn't. And I at the time I didn't know what a Texas yeah. leaguer was. I had never heard Call that him a term. Blooper too, right? But yeah, but but one of the other one of the one of the sergeants or corporals in the jeep with him says a short hit over the center over the second baseman's head or and something. And then someone <laughs> said Betty Grable, uh, <laughs> she's Romero says no no now it's Harry James. Not Cesar Romero's Romero. out. Yeah, yeah she right. mar she, mar she married <laughs> Harry James. <laughs> See, he's, you better keep up with your Hollywood uh, <laughs> captain. He says uh, I would have Cesar Romero's out. Well, that was a great picture. It was all about yeah. the uh, yeah. the battle bastards of Baston. I think it's Van Johnson that tells him you better keep up with your Hollywood uh, yeah. gossip. <laughs> Yeah. Cesar Romero's out. There was another good companion piece called Gopher Broke about the 442nd. The Nisei. Nisei. I've never seen that film. Very, very well yeah. done picture, yeah. yeah. It was, of course, it was done in formula. He was like very much anti Japanese when he gets the command, and, and, and uh, he learns to like the people. And, Who plays the commander? Van Johnson. Van Johnson? He was always a commander. I've never seen the picture, so yeah. I don't know. <laughs> one spot, one spot they, it's the Italian campaign, they either capture a bunch of Germans, and the woman says, you, you are Japanese. Van <laughs> Johnson says, "Yeah, didn't Hitler tell you they're on our side now?" <laughs> <laughs> so it was beautifully done. It was uh, what movie was it? Tora, 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 where one of the officers had a Japanese wife and they had all kind of problems. That's in the Battle of Midway. Okay, that's Midway? the movie about Midway. Uh, Charlton Heston's son is engaged oh, yeah, with right. a Japanese yeah, girl. Right. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah oh, no. Charlton Heston's son, who's a flyer, I believe, a Navy flyer, and he wants to get permission to marry the girl, and the girl's been interned. With you know the the relocation of the Japanese, right? Yeah, but you know you know who kind of started that? Who? Uh, Warren. Earl well, Warren, Warren was governor. governor. He was the governor, 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 of, governor California. of California. He's right. the one that suggested it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was a dirty, you know. J. But that was a different time and a different uh, era. Still, too, so. No, it was a J. Edgar Hoover was opposed to it. You know, J. Edgar know, Hoover always gets deal. a bad press on everything, but Hoover was opposed well, to I the was internment. Aware of that. Well, as, as he someone, told Roosevelt someone was that he telling didn't, me, didn't feel it was necessary. Someone was telling me, well, there was wartime. And in a lot of countries, they have interned people. I said, yeah, they're foreign nationals and combatants, not American citizens. No. That's what they were. If he had limited the internment to only non-American citizens. That might have. These people were, yeah, yeah to, to lock up American citizens was, you know. It was like, uh, you're going, sell your place now. Sell your house, sell your property, whatever you yeah. have. You know. But, in, you know, and I, I, it was wrong, but you have to understand the, the, the fear at the, because of the attack on Pearl Harbor. I think mm -hmm. it's understandable that they did it. It was wrong, no. right. yeah. but I think it is understandable, oh, given right. the mm -hmm. fear. The they'd, they'd had what was called the fifth column in Europe, where Germans, Germans would, would go to these various countries like Denmark. They would infiltrate, and then on the day of the invasion, these German tourists would show up on the street decked out in uniforms and carrying... So there was this fear of infiltration. Right. Well, which brings an interesting question, though. Rich and I are both of German descent here, and uh, uh, the, nothing was done like with the Germans here. We had the, the Bund before. I remember. But you know, but always in seeing. It, but remember, in World War One, we went through a spasm of anti-German hysteria. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. when right. they didn't lock all the Germans Very up because there were too many of them. You couldn't yeah. lock right. all of them. Right. Yeah. But but they did go. You know, uh, sauerkraut became Liberty yeah. cabbage and. Mm -hmm. Dachshunds became Liberty Hounds. The uh, Bismarcks American became fries. became Pershings. Actually, instead of Bis Bismarck <laughs> Bakery, they were called Pershings instead. <laughs> it was uh, the <laughs> Cats and Jammer kids became now Dutch. Now they're called <laughs> Cats and Jammer kids became Dutch in the paper for a Did while. Did they? Yeah. Did they? And they were strictly from uh, you know what their origin is. Cats and Jammer. My mom there was a, a an German. old German wood carving drawings by a yeah. guy named Wilhelm Busch. Hans, uh, Max and Moritz was it all about these two bad boys. Right. And William Randolph, Randolph Hearst got a gift to this book. And he says, can somebody come up with something like this for the papers? So he gave the assignment to... Durr. Was his Wasn't his name Durr? The man that no, that was the second guy. Uh, Wilhelm Busch. Uh, Rudolf Dirks was a young Dirks. German kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. A Chicagoan. Parents were from Germany. They came up with this beautiful yeah. Hans and Fritz. And the, the captain... It's not their father. Mo mo and the mother was a widow who came to live with the captain. The boys were. Yeah. Super well, you wound up with the cats and jammer kids, and then you had the captain and uh -huh, the kids. Because the, the uh, Dirks went on vacation. Yeah. So while he was gone, this nerd took it over. He comes back, and what is this, you know? So he goes over to the other paper. Yeah. Same characters he yeah. called the captain and the kids. Yeah. There was a big lawsuit over that. And they, and they continued in parallel for a there long time. There was a big time. lawsuit settled, and yeah. ju a judge ruled that our 
cartoonist's characters, I mean his drawings, are like his signature. They belong, they, they can't be taken away from him. So you had uh, King Features, or you know, the, the, uh, the, the Cats and Jammer Cats kids. Cats and Jammer, and, and, uh, and the, the Captain, captain and, and the Kids, kids the yeah. Side, yeah. Mm, yeah. Same characters. In parallel for a, for a long time. This stuff was going on until yeah. recent years. Yeah. As I understand it, I think Cats and Jammers are still continued. I think one of them is still yeah. Not in our paper, but no. But the Catsies. A lot of these cartoons now are available on, on online. Right, you know, right. So yeah. and I think should. another sign of the greater anti-German feeling in World War One: a lot of schools stopped teaching German. Teaching German? I think well. that barely happened in the oh. Second World War. Might no. have been a few districts yeah. here and there. There but was uh, on the whole no. They didn't play. Uh, they didn't play uh, Beethoven or Brahms. All these German composers. Oh yeah. Oh they, they, yeah. Those, evil, those, those evil. The music was out of favor. So there was there was anti-German hysteria. Right? I, I know. And in, in my mo my my grandmother and uh, my mother uh, my mother's folks came from Austria before the First World War. She had never become a citizen uh, officially, you know, and herself. So she went. And she studied and she got you know made sure she got her citizenship. Right. Another relative. They're, they're made. My mother's name was First F E R E S T, F U E R S T. If that means Prince, Force. Yeah, it does. Prince, yeah. yeah. An illegitimate Prince. Yeah, yeah. Force. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Uh, uh, my older, her oldest sister married another man named First, who came from Austria. Also, to the day he died, he Gus never lost his accent, but he was a citizen, and married with you know my aunt, and uh, he was getting these no draft notices all of a sudden. And he took it down to the, I don't know where he took it to, our draft board or who, and they said, what about this? He goes, you're an American citizen? Forget it. Well, I figured, they probably figured, send out these letters. We'll get a few guys here and there probably, you know, ordering them to come back to the motherland. Mm -hmm. Well, but everybody uh, everybody knows that our commanding general in World War II in Europe, Dwight David Eisenhower, was German. German. But not everybody knows that John J. Pershing, the commanding general mm -hmm. in the First World War, was also German. Yeah. His family name was right. Fersing. When oh. they came to the States, his name was, was anglicized. Right. Uh, what was the name? P-F-O-E-R-S-I-N-G, Fersing. Black Jack Pershing was Black German. Black Jack huh? Fersing was German. And, and people don't realize that oh, he was yes. German as well. How many so other officers? In both of the wars, our supreme commander in Europe was German. There we go. Oh, excuse me, gentlemen. It's time for another brief intermission. You've been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians. Gentlemen, who came in? <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> Friends, are you looking for a place to have some printing done? Well, I have the right place for you to go, and that is the printing store in Oak Park, Illinois. Call or see Phil Berry at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, Illinois, or call 708-383-3638. Phil will sit down with you and help you plan whatever you need printed. Now his products are brochures, booklets, business cards, catalogs, envelopes, letterheads, flyers, invitations, newsletters, notepads, menus, mailers, manuals, labels, posters, postcards, price list, NCR forms, cell sheets, table tents, pocket folders, and presentation forms. And his services include one to four color offset printing, digital copying, high speed copying, graphic designs, typesetting, laminating, foil stamping, die cutting, and imprinting. And he also has a complete binary service which includes booklets, cutting, scoring, folding, numbering, padding, and drilling. So once again, for all your printing needs, See or call Phil Berry at the printing store at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, Illinois, or call 708-383-3638. And once again, they are located at Madison Street and Clarence Avenue, just east of Oak Park Avenue. And it's at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, or call 708-383-3638. And ask to speak to. Now back to our show. 
1972. Well, here we are. He we're getting died. in the uh, home stretch, and we're right now we're getting into a kind of a uh, discussion of nationality and how mm -hmm. uh, royalty uh, run, flies in the face mm -hmm. of it because the what the the royal family weren't they all related? I mean, was uh, wasn't the in uh, the first world war most of the the, yeah. the, 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 the British they all related, like for Queen Victoria British yeah. the German and the Russian royal families were had intermarried and were related as well as many of the other lesser royal families oh. they all intermarried because you know the idea was if you were if you were a, the a prince or a princess in a royal family you had to marry someone who was equal to you in mm -hmm. status so you married another prince or princess from some foreign royal family. Mm -hmm. So they were all intermarried. Mm. Led to a bit of hemophilia among some of the royals. Because well, of inbreeding. Yeah. Yeah. Queen yeah. Victoria, yes. Yeah. So that's um, how you wound up, wound up with uh, uh, the, the heir of the, the Russian imperial throne. Right. We're in the 100th, 100th anniversary of Rasputin. one of the great catastrophes. I consider a great catastrophe of the Russian Russian Revolution. The Russian Revolution. Yeah. Uh, and, and, of course, right. uh, the, one, of the, one of the things that contributed to it was the illness of the Tsar's elder, uh, only son, his only son, which brought Rasputin in, and, and that discredited the imperial family and contributed to the revolution. Rasputin, the wrestler. And the, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the interesting thing about it is, they never revealed to the people that the Tsar's son had hemophilia. The average, mm -hmm. no one knew this outside of the court. Therefore, they couldn't understand why this this scurvy, holy man, was being allowed so close to the royal family. It's been suggested if the people knew the illness that the Tsar's son had, there would have been a greater sympathy, there would have been an understanding for it, but, the, but they felt that that would betray weakness to let the people know that the, the heir to the throne had this, had this terrible illness that couldn't be treated. There was no treatment for him. Now, now speaking of the Russian Revolution, there are some homogenized versions that goes like, oh, the uh, Lenin and the guys overthrew the Tsar. No. They didn't. They overthrew no. the people who overthrew the Tsar. Isn't that correct? Yeah, Kerensky and a socialist group? Kerensky uh, and others. And, and, and at the beginning, every, they even, even, there were even aristocrats that were involved in it. But the, 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 the revolutionary government fell apart. There was no strong leader. They, couldn't, they, they continued the war with the Germans. and the right. people, Everybody in Europe was exhausted. By 1917, everybody wanted out of the war. The Germans were starving. There had been mutinies in the French army. France almost dropped out of the war in 1917. Yeah. In fact, if it hadn't been for Pétain, who was one of the great heroes of the French in the First World War, he actually kept the France together in 1917 because he was smart enough to realize they couldn't just launch these suicidal offensives and keep sacrifice. But, but the bottom line is that, that, that the, the Tsar was overthrown by others and then the communists moved in and overthrew oh, them. Mm -hmm. Now, wouldn't... Uh, couldn't we say that the United States entry in 1917 had something to do with France staying oh, in? Go, oh, God, yes. Yeah. The yeah. If there wa was not the hope of fresh American troops entering the war, France would France would have had to, to come to peace terms. Very likely. France was exhausted. And, and so were the British. And yeah. the, Br the British, be, being an island, I mean, they didn't face actual invasion from the Germans. The, and the British Army... Had had been involved in some bloodbaths, but they had been involved in these bloodbaths largely to take the pressure off the French. The the British were launching these 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 horrendous offensives against the Germans because the French were pleading for them to do something to take the pressure off the French army. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if there hadn't been the hope of the United States yeah. entering the war, Europe would have would have come to terms in 1917, which in as as history turned out might actually have been better in the long run. Well, the, the a negotiated <laughs> settlement, a negotiated settlement might have actually wound up better than what we want what we ended with with the Treaty of Versailles. Well, there, there was no more Eastern Front because of the Ru Russia Russians dropping right out. Yeah. So, um, basically, well, that was their fear. The fear, the fear of the Allies was that now the Eastern Front is 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 closed. The Germans were shifting all those mm -hmm. soldiers, mm -hmm. and they were preparing for this massive offensive in, in the West. West. If it hadn't been for the hope of American troops, and ultimately if it hadn't been for the American troops themselves, the Allies would have probably been knocked out of the war. Over there. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. But so we <laughs> virtually all the American troops used French weapons? Uh, Certainly early on they did. We, yeah. had, we yeah. had no American airplanes. Yeah. There were no American tanks. And they were largely using British, not French, but British rifles. They were okay. using they were using British rifles. We didn't rifles. have an army very if much. We had an army, but in name only, I think. No, we had we had we had one of the smallest armies in the mm -hmm. world. It's amazing that we were. We, but by by the time the war was over, we had two million troops. We had two million troops, mm -hmm. 
And if the war had lasted until 1919, which everyone expected, nobody expected the war to end in the fall of 1918, we would have had three or four or five million troops in Europe. I mean, that's, how, that's how big the army was. We would have had an air force. We, were, we had on the drawing boards, we were beginning to build planes. American-made planes were in the warehouses or were being shipped to Europe. We would have had 5,000 aircraft by 1918. We would have been, we would have been a superpower. Mm -hmm. by, by 1919 if the war had lasted that long. But it didn't, and the war ended before that all level of power. Well, see, we were in from, what was, what was the, our declaration of war? April, April, April 1917. April, 6, April 1917, 1917 to November of 1918. And we didn't get into after. combat until April of 1918. The first real engagement of American troops yeah. takes place Hard in to believe it took a year, but given the year. state, yeah. 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 And this upset the, the French in particular no end. They thought when we declared war that, you know, two weeks later we were going to have an right. army right. over there. And they couldn't understand that six months later, there's still no American troops in action. It was it was a big problem mm -hmm. for yes. the. It was kind of the same way in World War II. World getting War II, right? It takes time for a country that, sure. that is not a military nation to yeah. gear up and right. train and equip yeah. and outfit and supply an army and then send it across right. an ocean mm -hmm. and put it in the battle. It's one thing if it's in the Philippines where you are already. Yeah. When they, they are, yeah. you know, right. You've got troops over there. But, but they, they took us. They went into North Africa instead of going invasion of Europe. Well, no. I'll give you an example in World War II. The, the op Operation Torch, which is the first American operation, major operation against the Nazis, first operation against the Nazis of any kind, is November of 1942. It's mm -hmm. about 11 months after Pearl Harbor. Uh, our, our, our actions in the uh, Guadalcanal campaign is in the fall of 1942. It took us a, close to a year mm -hmm. to get geared up in, in World War II. So, it just takes time to get the United the United States in those days was not the United States we know today. We didn't have a standing army and a, na and a we had a navy, but we did not have troops, right. a huge ground army that we could just send overseas and, and put into action. And we made the a decision invasion. early on to focus on the Germans rather than, rather the, than Japanese. the Japanese. Yeah, the yeah. first yeah. invasion was with Palermo in Italy. Oh, well, that would be Sicily. Well, that's right? forty. Yeah. You're now you're talking forty three. That's yeah. that's. Well, when was the first invasion in? Well, Palermo Europe. is Sicily. That's after we had after we'd cleared out North okay, Africa. Okay, was a little north. What was? It was in Italy. The first, the island of Sicily, Naples, oh. Palermo, Palermo, I mean, and Messina were the yeah, two big yeah, cities. Okay. They yeah. And about that time, the Italians That's revolted 43. against uh, Mussolini's rule. With the fall, right. of, yeah, when, when Admiral uh, Broglio became uh, with the, the right. fall of Sicily when when they landed it with the, the landings in Italy. That was that was the signal for the the yeah. Japanese for for the for the Italian leadership to decide that they'd had enough of yeah. Mussolini. I know they rescued Mussolini from uh, the Germans. Yeah, mm -hmm. they arrested yeah, the Italians. Kept them on as a puppet in northern the Italy. Italians got them later, but I mean they yeah. didn't rescue them. Yeah, they kind of yeah. Otto Scorzani, the they looked like he lost some weight. shooter. Yeah, but didn't they like? Hang him up from a light pole or something. Well, that's a, that was later when the the, well, the, the, con the oh, communists yeah. caught him in yeah. Milan. Him and his mistress Clara Patacci, and they hung him from his heels. And, and you know, they claim that's that that was the inspiration for Hitler to taking his own life. That he he had, he had seen he the pictures see of what happened to mm. Mussolini, that's right. and that he did not. Well, he he, well, he, <laughs> he saw he the handwriting on the wall. Shot and battered and hanged upside down. And yeah, what, you yeah, know. yeah. But yeah, the Italian government, his own fascist government, deposed him in, in 1943. With, with Did with they do the same thing to his wife? No. No, his no, no. His wife lived on. His wife oh. lived on. Mussolini's wife. Oh yeah, I yeah. His wife uh, uh, lived on. She was still alive in the the 50s. I remember. Uh, I saw an interview with Sophia Loren, and she knew the Mussolini family, and they were. I mean, they were. There was not a sense that his wife bore any guilt for what Mussolini had done. So his mm -hmm. wife uh, was pretty much left alone in retirement, to the best well, of my knowledge. Wasn't she on What's My Line? <laughs> I don't know about <laughs> that. I don't, I don't know if it went quite that far. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it would today, a celebrity out of it. Yeah. You know. Well, it's okay. interesting that uh, sometimes when you see Hitler in the newsreels coming across as kind of pompous and arrogant, <laughs> yeah. when you see Mussolini in newsreels, that guy's like a strutting peacock. He is, An yeah. object of making fun of, the way he poses and that sort yeah, of but thing. But he's also an impressive physical yeah. specimen. He's big <laughs> and burly. So I'd, like to, I'd really like to Hitler know the relationship, a, he versus Hitler. He wanted to have the new Holy Roman Empire. Right, right. Which maybe Hitler wasn't too fond of. It, Hitler occasionally had to come to Mussolini's rescue in Greece, that sort of thing. Has anyone you ever mean, seen... Uh, uh, the Great Dictator? 
I saw years it ago. I, I wish I had seen it. But there was like there was a competition in there. They were spoofing it. Jack Oakey plays. Yeah, Benzino well, Napoloni. He wants to sit up <laughs> higher in the chair than uh, Napoloni. Ben, uh, his name there, is Benzino Napoloni. They're the two Napoloni. barber chairs. They keep bumping up yeah, higher and higher. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You yeah, remember though, Mussolini? You know, he, he comes to power eleven years before Hitler. Oh yeah, early twenties. Nineteen twenty-two. Yeah. Nineteen twenty-two, yeah. and yeah. he was not considered a joke in the nineteen twenties. No. no. He was highly regarded. Uh, he did a lot to restore the government. Churchill yeah. thought highly of Mussolini. FDR thought well of Mussolini. It was Mussolini. said that he made the trains run on time. There was this sense that, the 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 sense that he, had, he had been an effective leader, that yeah. he had, he had uh, governed well. His downfall was getting tied in with Adolf Hitler. I mean, that was, right. that was the beginning of the end of Mussolini. But prior to that, Mussolini was not considered the buffoon yeah. that, that he was later considered as Hitler's junior partner and this... That's not the way he was looked at in the twenties. Well, you've We're mentioned a few Italians fought on the Russian front. Uh, that that was, that was draining Italian resources too. Yeah. 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 What's that now? Uh, quite a few Italians were fighting with well, the yeah. Germans on the Russian front. Yes, the Spain contributed some uh, uh, yeah. so troops there too. Yeah, the oh, yeah. Even though they didn't declare war. But old Franco. Yeah, he was. Uh, he pretty much stayed out of the war, though. That's yeah. interesting. They did know. stay out really yeah. <laughs> officially. Yeah. Yeah. He stuck around for a long time, but they it had been said that the Spanish Civil War of 1936 was it 35? That was like the dress rehearsal for World right. War II. Right, the, yeah. the loyalist yeah. side was being aided by Joe Stalin, Stalin. and the other side with uh, the Italians Franco and the was Germans, you know, yeah. from uh, Germany and Italy. The bombing of civilians, yeah. use yeah. of air power. Yeah. yeah. So who, boy, that there's a choice for you. Who's going to be whose side you going to choose? Well, Those that was the Spanish Civil War. You had a choice between the communists and, and the, the Nazis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, boy. Except, except that that Franco was neither. Franco was neither a communist nor a, nor, nor even a really in, in the strict sense of the terms of fascist. Probably, right, right. He had he had fascist supporters, but Franco was basically a monarchist. Franco Franco ultimately restored the monarchy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the great story, I read a story about about uh, uh, there were some British diplomats who met with Franco in 1940. They were trying to persuade him to come along to the Allied side. And they're ushered into Franco's private office, and he's at his desk. And behind the desk, there's a, there are framed portraits of Hitler and Mussolini. Hmm. So the British diplomats realize they're not going to have much luck, you know, getting him over. Three years later, 1943, these same diplomats are granted. They're, they're still trying to get Franco on their side. They come to see Franco in 1943. Same office. The portraits of Hitler and Mussolini are gone. Mm. And they've been replaced by a framed portrait of Pope Pius the <laughs> Twelfth. <laughs> so they realize that things had changed, and they might they might have a better <laughs> chance of negotiating. So you could tell by the photographs on his credenza which way the wind was blowing. He and he stayed in power long after the war. Oh, yeah. he did in the seventies. At least the seventies. Right? Yeah. He Made um, a joke on Saturday Night Live. He had kind of like a plan for a more peaceful and Spain. I mean, did, uh, gradual. Yeah. Gradual. And he had no intention of getting into the war. I mean, he were Mussolini. Mussolini did not want to get into the war, but but he, when he saw Hitler scoring these early victories, he decided he wanted to get in on some of the swag. Mm. But Franco was smart enough to stay out. No. Mm. And Hitler met with with Franco and tried to. They had a they had a Ooh, meeting at a little town yeah. called Hendai, H E N D A Y E, and Hitler personally met with him, mm. and tried to pressure him into declaring war. And Franco yeah. refused. And Hitler mm. later said that rather than spend another hour negotiating with Franco, he would rather have several teeth pulled <laughs> without <laughs> Novocaine. Yeah. Yeah. He was getting nowhere, is that yeah, it? Yeah, it was like negotiating with a brick wall. <laughs> he yeah. just couldn't. <laughs> well, he was, in, was this in Spain? Yeah, it's like on the border between Maybe France the Pyrenees, and Spain. Like yeah, that, in the yeah. Pyrenees. Yeah. Yeah. He met with Peytan. He met with Franco. And then he met with Mussolini. He was like mm -hmm. meeting with all yeah, the southern, southern leaders. <laughs> It's interesting, a little sidebar, you mentioned the Pyrenees and Spain and France. Everyone is familiar with that. It's a book, and that was a movie of the Song of Bernadette. Oh, yes. All yeah. about Lourdes. Yeah. 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 Uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, Bernadette Subiru. The, what was his name? Is it Verfeld? No, 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 no. Mm. I can't think of the name. Verfeld, yeah, the name of the author. is something like Ooh. Verfeld. He was an uh, Austrian yeah. Jew, and he was, he was big in society. I'll think of it later, probably, I'm sure. Um, but anyway, um, Jennifer Jones played. That's right. played yeah, but I'm saying Vincent Same Price version. was in it, and alone, oh, yes. Charles Bickford. Yeah. Bickford. But anyways, he was in Vienna. Okay, along comes the Anschluss Union with Germany. They leave. They go to Paris, him and the wife. Along comes the fall <laughs> of France. Huh. He tries to get out then. He gets over to 
right around Lourdes you know, for, for a while okay. in France. And they said himself, he said a little prayer to himself, he said, to the Blessed Virgin, he says, you know I don't believe in you, but if you help me get out of here, I'll tell the, the world your story about oh. Lourdes. <laughs> he got out, oh. goes to New York, writes the book. Two That's years later, it's a movie, too. Yeah. Oh. He also wrote the, um, oh shoot, why can't I give his name? Um, and he also wrote the uh, the scri- the play that became part of the movie Juarez. Ah, okay. Oh, it was yeah. uh, all about yes. the uh, yeah, which is another the good Phantom movie. Crown or something was the name of it. Or well, it's the story of uh, Emperor. Really, it's much. It's, it's as much the Emperor Maximilian as it is yeah. about oh, Juarez. Oh, sure it is. Yeah. yeah. Paul Muni. Yeah, yeah. And Brian yeah. Ahern yeah. plays yeah. Right. the Emperor Maximilian. Maximilian. Yeah. Um, and they portray Maximilian very favorably in the. He film. did. Yeah. 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 He also. Um, I didn't realize till yesterday, maybe. Uh, Maximilian was uh, Emperor Franz Joseph's brother. Yeah, they were they were oh, brothers. Sorry, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah, younger yeah. brother. Yeah. yeah, he he thought he would. Franz Joseph, a, Austria, Hungary. That is gain a crown by going to, going to going to to Mexico, and actually wanted to be a wise and benevolent ruler. Right, and fair, and pri- and, and in many ways, well, he was. It's well played there. Yeah, in the one spot where he, it's a shock when he hears how many people are are up in arms against him. Yeah, <laughs> and that they didn't realize that this. Plebiscite was a phony. It was, free, yeah. it was just yeah. uh, conducted by. Uh, but the Gary French. Cooper and Bert Lancaster helped overthrow. I like that movie, Vera Cruz. Any Vera number Cruz, of yeah. movies. Yeah. John <laughs> Wayne and, and Rock Hudson. And, uh, that was the. Uh, um, is it true that John Wayne's voice was a put on? John Wayne's voice was yeah, a Yeah, they said he had a real <laughs> high pitched voice. No. He might have worked on it. Patton. Huh? Patton had a high. The real yeah. George Patton okay. did not sound like George C. Right. Scott. No, he had kind of a squeaky high pitched voice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the personality was the same, but he did not have the voice what that George okay. C. Scott had. The movie you were talking about, John Wayne, Rock, 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 the Undefeated. Yeah, the Undefeated. Yeah, that's right. Guess what? That's the movie I first t- took my wife to see the first night we went out. Really? But it was across that's the street. So memorable. The, that was at the State Lake. The across the street, listen, was there. Butch Cassidy. That would have been a perfect date if it taken her there. <laughs> right there? I'm going to be giving a presentation on John Wayne in a couple of weeks, and yeah. uh, I want to find out the first time he ever used the expression pilgrim <laughs> in a movie. Uh, That's his trademark. Uh, I thought it was in... Probably on Thanksgiving Day. No, <laughs> I he, no, he I think uses Pilgrim it in the man who shot Liberty. Yeah, but that's, that's later. That's what it's yeah. Yeah. I think that's the only one I can think of. Yeah, I'll work on that. I, I think that was his trademark saying before that. I don't honestly know if he used it earlier than that. But I can't you, remember. But I you associate with him because of him shooting at yeah. at, uh, at Jimmy Stewart with the paint can. i got to work on that. Pilgrim! And he fires it. You know, yeah. the All Indians, right, Pilgrim, listen you know, up and listen good. I know. How many you know, John Wayne pictures? Tight. <laughs> he, he gets knocked on his rear end in the picture somewhere along the line. Oh, yeah. He after st- after he sh- after he shoots Stewart the paint can yeah. on, on yeah. Jimmy Stewart, but I think most of us remember his That's introduction. That's what you'll be up against <laughs> when you go against Fallon. when he first appeared in the movie Stagecoach. Yeah, when he's standing in the road, mm-hmm. blocking the stagecoach. Horse was gone, right? Up. Yeah, that's yeah. when most of us remember seeing John Wayne for the first time. Right. right. Otherwise, he was just making a lot of Republic westerns. Prior to yeah, that, and, and also that yeah. company yeah. Um, shoot him up westerns. Yeah. Was with Monogram, the Lone Star. Yeah, he was the first one to be a singing cowboy. Singing Sing Sandy, Sandy Saunders. <laughs> well, i got to get a clip of him singing. Did he singing. come after Gene Autry? Before. Before? Okay. Because Gene Autry was... You say uh, Gene, uh, uh, what's well, name? Gene John Wayne did some sing singing in a movie? What? I get, uh, John Wayne did some singing in a movie? Yeah, that one. Yeah. Well, i got to go. I gotta singing, Sandy. Sandy. singing Sandy Saunders. But Gene Autry was a telegrapher for, for the, the Santa Fe Railroad. Gonna and he was practicing his guitar. Gonna shoot you. Something else. But that walk of his, that gate of John Wayne. You know, it goes to show you... How they changed names. John Wayne was what? Marion Michael, Michael Morrison. Morrison. Morris. Yeah. Uh, Roy Rogers was Leonard Sly. Sly. That's right. Gene Autry was Eugene Autry. Oh, so. I know that. Okay. <laughs> Probably. Not much yeah. of a change. Yeah. So, that's my little funny for the day. <laughs> Getting back to the <laughs> Westerns. <laughs> 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 a singing cowboy. Who was the mayor up the northwest side? It was a singing Bob cowboy. Atcher. Bob Atcher. Yeah. Bob Atcher was the low. He was a country. He was from Kentucky. He was a uh, of Schomburg. Yeah. He was, yeah. He was the mayor there for quite a while. Yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah. Huh. Bob Atcher, I remember him as a local on the uh, barn dance or on uh, what else? Didn't he have a, I think he had an evening uh, western thing where he was uh, hosted, you know, his, you know, one of those, uh, like Tessa, Texas Bruce Roberts, Country remember him? Show. Was he on remember Bruce Howard Roberts? Miller on Saturday night a couple times? Yeah, Howard Who? Miller. Who? Gene Autry. Was he on Gene Autry? No, who were we just talking about? Bob Atcher? Bob yes, Atcher, yeah. He might have been on with, uh, um, 
Jim Moran used to have once in a while have like a, a he'd have a variety yes. show thing instead of a uh -huh. movie. And one time it was with the westerns too. He called him the King of the Cowboys. Huh. One time he did some aquatic, he had some aquatic acts. I remember that. Uh -huh. Remember that, John? Was it at WGN used to, or maybe they still do it on Friday or Saturday night old time movies? Channel 7 didn't I don't did a lot see of much it. of that anymore. They Channel all did movies at one time. Yeah, Channel 7 would run movies after midnight. Okay, they would maybe that's what I'm On thinking. weeknights. Until recent, they they had uh, the old RKO collection. Was it Movie Time USA? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. I, I used to love, uh, like on New Year's Eve, they would they would start running all the Fred Astaire Ginger yeah. Rogers. And, they, and then for the next four or five nights, they would run a, a Fred Astaire Ginger Rogers black They'd run and them white all night long. RKO yeah, musical. They well, they also on, on New Year's Eve, they'd run two yeah. or three of them. But then they would, Marx for Brothers the rest too, of the did. week, they would run they would run the uh, the remaining. Yeah, they were running Marx Brothers for a while, too, yeah. maybe after the The Marx Astaire. Brothers, but yeah. now that, that's no And, of course, you know, you had when movies were movies with Carl Grayson on right, WGN back right. in the late 60s. Was it that, that ran the, the Three Stooges on Saturday evenings? What was that now? He used the to three run the Three Stooges. Stooge oh, well, it was Carl Grayson to no, begin it's, with. No, it, then it was it, Bob the Bell and Andy uh, Starr. He's still around. You're talking about Rich Coase. Yeah. yeah. Svengoolie. Oh. Well, he used to run Yeah, the, and they're the not Stooges. running. The, they're running this week on, on uh, Decades. They're running uh, Three Stooge-related documentaries and things they I had think, a yeah. his well, Moe's son did a did a, a, a series of, of DVDs it's called uh, Hey Mo Hey Dad the story of the three stooges okay and it's like five five one-hour episodes I believe and they're running that this week on on the decades channel what you mean the, uh, the series about them about yeah the whole yeah, story I, I, yeah, I, I was pretty good Ooh, it was it I was very well that. done it was it opened up the show was Mo was like a messenger boy in, in Columbia Back on the studio at the time, oh, yeah, yeah, he was all you know. Was but nobody ever liked Curly. Yeah, yeah. nobody liked his dudes. That was Howard, well, I, Curly I, Howard, and then it was Larry well, Horowitz, Curly really, Howard, yeah. and Shemp Howard. Right, yeah. Jerome Horowitz. Yeah, and Morris. Moses Morris. Morris. And I Horowitz think a is lot of name, yeah. women did particularly. Well, well, that's the stereotype you get. Yeah, yeah. What's that? Well, yeah. They, yeah. They didn't the was too violent. The, the violence, yeah. And I've not been no. It wouldn't let kids watch it because Who, of the violence. Well, Laurel That's and Hardy, argument. it was said, no one liked them but the public. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they were, you know. That's classic Laurel and Hardy. They you tear down their neighbor's house. You know. <laughs> it's like Sam Goldwyn's line about a restaurant, a, 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 a restaurant in Hollywood. He says, "Oh, nobody goes there. It's too crowded." Didn't you know the <laughs> uh, <that? laughs> well, Sam Goldwyn. It was he uh, was still that about uh, was it Twitch Shores? Nobody goes there anymore. <laughs> no, it's so crowded. Some, nobody goes there anymore. Sometimes those comments they <laughs> get interchangeable <laughs> yeah. between yeah. Sam Goldwyn and Yogi Berra because they were both noted yeah, for Yogi. saying these. Yogi. these, hey, yo Yogi. these they, they make sense, but yeah. they they sound yeah. strange yeah. the way. Yogi, they're. what time is it? You mean right now? <laughs> right, or why are you going to his wake? He says, well, if I don't go to his, he won't come to won't mine. Come to mine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sam uh, Goldwyn said a handshake agreement isn't worth the paper it's printed on. Yeah. Right. Uh, a lot of Casey Stengels were kind of like that, too. True. What was that true. one that there was a, it was a commercial about, uh, well, it was an insurance company, and Yogi Berra was in the barber shop. Ooh, I missed that. In the duck. Oh, with the, the uh, Aflac? Yeah. The Aflac. Oh, yeah. Aflac. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He asked him, he says, what, when you get to the the fork in the road, take it? Or yeah, something? that was one of his, yeah. yeah. When you get to the fork in the road, take it. <laughs> Baseball is, what do you say? Baseball Jeez. is 95% yeah. desire and the other half is talent. <laughs> uh, it might something. be something to that. <laughs> wonder, wonder if he made those up on purpose or whatever. I think not. Uh, maybe later on. He never uh, caught it until he was into professional baseball. Right. He yeah. was an infielder or outfielder. He grew up with Joe DiMaggio. They lived a couple blocks apart from each other. Is when? That right? No, you, no, Yogi's from St. Louis. Yogi's from St. Louis. St. Louis and DiMaggio's San, from, from San, San Francisco. Francisco. Uh, yeah, Yogi's, Yogi's a St. Louis. Uh, well, yeah. One of them moved to someplace. They even call they, the area Dago them. Hills, yeah. where he lived. Dago <laughs> Hills? Dago, Dago oh. Hills. Yeah. Yogi Berra was <laughs> once at spring training down in Florida, and it's like 95 outside, and he sees a friend of his. He's driving his car. He picks him up. And the guy gets into the car, and it's 110 inside of the car. He's got all the windows rolled up. <laughs> and he says, Yogi, let me roll down the window. He says, no, 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 leave the windows rolled up. He says, why? He's that way everybody thinks I got air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, 
Yeah. Well, what was the announcer at Mel the Allen? Cubs? At the Cubs. Oh. In, in when? It might have been. Rick House? Um, yeah, it might have been him or something. But it was the hottest day, and they were screwing around with him. So they, they turned the heat on. They had electric heaters. Huh. Oh. It might have been Harry, too. Yeah, they probably, they and and so whoever they, was with they, them, they, they was going along. I feel fine, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, found out. And yeah, imagining yeah. living in an era with hardly any air conditioning—it's it's hard it's to believe hard. now. Yeah, well, um, I almost did that. I got my car right, and I didn't change. I got that heat setting from cold to hot. Yeah, and I turn on the air conditioning. Man, this air conditioning worth work, work beans. Finally, I figure out maybe it would work better if I turned the heat to cool. I got yeah. that 440 air conditioning. You got to roll down four windows and go 40 miles an yeah, hour. That's right. um, Used to be the old way. You got those no vent air. windows blowing yeah. in a certain way. Yeah. They just had the movie The Seven Year Itch on, and of course that's how Tom Ewell oh, yeah. gets Marilyn Monroe to spend the to, to talk about spending the night. I I didn't get to watch. I don't know if she winds up spending the night there or not, but that's, that's right. how he persuades her because it's it's stiflingly hot. It's New York. It's July, right. and Tom Ewell has air conditioning. So I've got air conditioning in every room. <laughs> And yeah. she's dying in her flat because she doesn't have air conditioning. Well, we didn't have it when we were first married. We had the house. What we would do is the front room was uh, like it was a cross with windows. It was a bungalow. So we put we just had the little one. We put everything down and we'd lay right on the floor get yeah. the cross breeze. And we survived that. But Might have had a lot of fans you, in the old days. Should, yeah. Yeah. Fans, yeah. Well, that's why supposedly the coolest place now to go in the summer is going to be Wrigley Field. There's a fan in every seat. No. And with that happy note, it looks like oh we are just about down to the okay. end. And we want to thank, uh, come on, what's your name? Don. Don? Yeah. Don who? Oh, Don Peter. No, Don, Don Ho. Don Ho. Don Ho. Uh, Rich, Rich Lang, your announcer. John Escachalco. Daryl Kogelman. <laughs> we'll have to leave early. And Ace the Wonder And this is Jack Ryan. <laughs> On behalf of our mentor, our leader, John DeVita, remember, history is much more than a book that you keep on the shelf. Mm -hmm. We wish to thank Kevin of JACKFM, WRHS 89.7 FM, for broadcasting our shows over the Ridgewood Radio Network. Recordings of previous Meet the Chicago Historians programs are available for your listening pleasure via the internet at www.windycityhometown.com. We single out a special thank you to the executive producer of Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network, John Seconda. On behalf of everyone associated with our Historians program, we thank you for listening. This is your announcer, Rich Lang. So long until next time. You have been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians from the John DeVita Broadcast Center on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Monday, June the 19th, the year 2017. This broadcast was produced by Jack Ryan, directed by John DeVita, and our special thanks once again to the executive producer of Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network, Mr. John Chiconda. This broadcast was pre-recorded on Monday, June the 19th, the year 2017. Be safe and thanks for listening. <laughs>